Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. It was 2008. My family lived in rural Nevada, and my dad was a hunting guide and convinced my mom to move up to Alaska. We made the 3,000-mile drive along the Alaskan Highway through Canada, spending a particularly large amount of time enjoying the Yukon Territory. We had three vehicles, all large trucks with trailers full of stuff. If you've driven along the Alaskan Highway, there are lots of very large rest areas. My dad built an enclosure atop his tailgate of the truck and built a room with windows in it so my brothers and I could hang out and not be strapped into a seat the whole drive. My dad, being an avid hunter, had some real trouble getting his 30-plus guns through customs into Canada, but once we were cleared, he kept a 500 caliber revolver, bare protection, in the cab with him. It was so late, I don't know what time, but was incredibly dark outside, and we stopped at a rest stop somewhere outside of the Laird Hot Springs, British Columbia area give or take 50 miles. I was young. We were all asleep when all of a sudden we heard several gunshots coming from inside the cab of the truck. My mom was hysterical and the other driver of the other vehicle was outside with a shotgun. My dad and he approached the edge of the cleared rest area and all I could see was a very dense wall of trees. I didn't get to see it, but when they had parked the lights were on and illuminating the wall of forest. My dad was just looking ahead when all of a sudden he realized an immensely large figure was standing perfectly still, just at the edge of the tree line. He didn't notice it, though, until it stepped towards our truck. He recalls its eyes being incredibly green, and the reflection of the headlights made its eyes almost glow. My mom and the other driver's girlfriend were in the porta potty just to the left of the trucks, so my dad immediately pulled out the revolver and started shooting. As he was terrified, the figure was going towards the porta potties. After the first shot was fired, he said he'd never seen an animal react so fast and with such ease. I think about this night a lot and figured I'd get the story out there. Some extras. It was not a bear whatsoever. My dad had been a seasonal traveling hunting guide for a few years at this point and had bagged several bears from black to brown to grizzly. We've driven that road several times since this night as we've been back and forth between Alaska and Nevada for years and have not had another encounter. Still gives me insane chills, though. In late September 1962, my three friends and I, all hailing from Chicago, were on our way back to the Twin Lakes cottage our parents had rented for the month. We had just returned from a visit to Grand Haven, where we'd gone to witness the grand opening of a musical fountain. The drive had taken us about two hours, and at this point we were roughly 15 minutes away from reaching Twin Lakes. We were navigating along Dewey Lake Street, the bumpy gravel road that meandered between a swamp on the eastern side of Dewey Lake Road. As we slowed down on this narrow, winding gravel path, our car's headlights suddenly illuminated something that caught our attention. My friend Randy Imes pointed out what appeared to be a colossal tree right in the middle of the road. The sight was quite perplexing. Our driver, Terry Jones, decided to stop the car, unsure of how to proceed. It was at this moment that the tree did something wholly unexpected. It turned around to face us, Terry later described the creature as towering over us, standing directly in our path. Then, in a remarkably nonchalant manner, it started walking over towards the swamp on the north side of Dewey Lake Road and vanished into the darkness. The girls in the car with us were screaming loudly, and it didn't stop until we were almost back at the cottage. Jones recalled, I was genuinely worried about how to get past that thing, so I didn't stop but I distinctly remember seeing it walk away into the swamp, disappearing into the darkness. Randy, I'm added, I really wanted to go back the next day in daylight, but I have to admit I was frightened at the thought of returning to that road if that thing showed up again. Years later, I did go back with friends while on vacation. The road had been paved by then, but that didn't make a 
difference. That place was eerie even in broad daylight. Story 3. On a Sunday night in late September of 1962, I was one of five children playing in Glenwood, Michigan. We had just finished watching our favorite television shows and gathered together searching for a fabled Luna moth. It was around 9 p.m., and we were about to disperse and head home, preparing for school the next day. That's when Jamie Shaw suddenly darted across Dewey Lake Street in pursuit of what he assumed were fireflies. His friend Mark tried to warn him, shouting, Those aren't fireflies, especially not at this time of year. Nevertheless, Jamie was undeterred and continued chasing the distant embers into the swamp. The rest of us continued playing for a while, but soon Katie Keene's mother began calling for her to come home. That's when we realized Jamie hadn't returned. I remember asking, where is Jamie? But nobody had any idea. He hadn't come back from his firefly hunt. Initially, we weren't too alarmed, but as time passed and Jamie failed to reappear, we started to worry. We searched and called for him, but found nothing. We eventually notified Mrs. Howie and Mrs. Shaw about the situation. Soon the entire neighborhood came together and we began searching the area with flashlights. Just as Harry Woods, a local resident, was about to call the police, we made a startling discovery. Jamie was found curled up in a wee area beside the swamp, crying. Katie Keene remembered we were terrified, not knowing what had happened. We thought he might have been attacked or injured. Jamie later recounted a harrowing story to his parents. He claimed that he had been assaulted by a massive, hairy figure that had knocked him to the ground and tossed him across the street. In the days that followed, Jamie didn't attend school for three days. When he finally returned, he shared the story of the attack with his classmates. The school principal later contacted Jamie's father to discuss the injuries on Jamie's back which the principal believed were related to the incident from the previous Sunday night, the same story Jamie had conveyed to them. Jamie's teacher, Miss Sally, initially doubted his account. However, during a recess conversation where Jamie remained convinced that he had been attacked by something that had physically thrown him, Miss Sally stated, I'm astonished he wasn't killed. His injuries were severe. On the evening of Wednesday, October 31st, 1962, I found myself aboard the evening train departing from Detroit, Michigan, making my way back home to Chicago, Illinois. The train had already encountered delays, and as we approached the DAO and KI, it came to an unexpected halt at the remote Dewey Lake Street crossing in Glenwood, Michigan. We remained stationary for around 15 minutes, apparently due to the need to inspect the tracks for debris. During this pause, I gazed out of the window to the northwest into the dark surroundings. It was then that I had a surreal encounter. In the distance, emerging from the dense woods that enveloped the area and approaching the tracks, I saw what appeared to be a faceless tree or a giant stump. The mysterious figure stood there motionless leering at the train for several minutes. Intrigued and somewhat perturbed, I beckoned the attention of two fellow passengers, Emily Clark from Chicago and Roger Wentworth. From St. Louis, to my relief, they also observed the enigmatic sight. After a brief moment, the figure began to move from the tree line toward the train's caboose, which sat shrouded in darkness on the rural tracks. Our consensus was that this figure stood at an astonishing ten feet tall and weighed between 700 to 1,000 pounds. Soon the figure disappeared into the obscurity of the night, moving towards the rear of the train. We decided to call a porter, but before we could do much, the train resumed its journey, accompanied by a loud metallic impact that resonated from the rear of the train. We assumed this was the consequence of the train restarting its journey on these rural treks. The journey continued without any further peculiar incidents, and we eventually reached Chicago. However, upon arriving at Union Station in Chicago, departing passengers noticed a significant dent in the end car of the train. I felt compelled to report what I had witnessed, enlisting the support of my fellow witnesses, Emily Clark and Roger Wentworth. 
we took our account to the Chicago Police Department, CPD. To help the CPD comprehend my encounter better, they assigned a sketch artist to create a detailed rendering based on my description. This sketch is now known as the Garkin train sighting sketch and is widely recognized as the most accurate representation of the creature. Regrettably, despite our efforts, the case was dismissed and referred to other authorities outside of the department. The 1960s were a tumultuous era in Chicago, and the CPD seemed disinclined to invest much time or attention into what they considered a minor matter. They recommended that I file a report with the respective city, county, or state authorities since the incident took place outside of their jurisdiction. They expressed their overwhelming burden with actual crimes and the impracticality of engaging in an investigation related to a supposed monster sighting in Michigan. Consequently, the case was never subjected to further examination. This story is going to be lengthy, and I'm not sure if it will be as intriguing and intense for you as it is for me. But to this day, I still get chills, and my eyes well up when I think about this compilation of events. My tale begins when I was a child. I'm 30, five years old now, so this happened over 10 years ago. I was in seventh grade, around 13 years old, and my friend was having a birthday party. He lived about 20 miles outside of town, and his property bordered a river to the west, with a road about 1,000 yards east of the river. The house was situated about 100 yards from the river, nestled in a wooded area. There were about 10 of us, skateboarding and just doing what kids do, playing in the river and so on. I should mention that it was middle September, and I'm located in the northwest of the United States. As it became dark, the kids were still running around, and the family had a motor home for all the boys to stay in, where they could be loud, watch movies, until late in the morning. Around midnight, all the boys were inside the camper, watching Joe Dirt, my closest friend and I, being young and not wanting to hang out with the boys, were still outside with the birthday boys, sister and her friend, playing on the trampoline. We were clearly making noise, playing and talking. As the night grew later, the girls eventually went inside. My friend and I were just lying on the trampoline, looking out to the east toward the railroad and the highway. There was a 15-foot streetlight, for lack of a better term, between the trampoline and the house. Beyond the streetlight was a strip of cottonwoods and brush that acted as a windrow at the end of the wheat fields we were gazing at. As we were enjoying the night, something about 70 yards away in the windrow caught our attention. It was massive, but moving silently. In fact, everything around us had become eerily silent. The woods, the camper, and us. This thing stepped out, and I was positioned between two trees. It turned its head toward us, making direct eye contact, clearly acknowledging our presence. What we saw were two piercing red eyes of Papa Deer like head with antlers protruding. It was incredibly tall, at least seven feet, when I checked the branch next to it the next day. I've spent years hunting and been in some very sticky situations. I've even had a mountain lion tracking me in the woods, but the only thing I can compare this experience to is the feeling of being prey. In my heart of hearts, I knew there was nothing I could do to protect myself from this entity. The most perplexing part of the entire encounter was that I'm a very logical person, and even today it's challenging for me to understand. I need to stress the situational awareness of what was happening. The streetlight between us and this entity was still illuminated, and yet this creature was casting a shadow towards the light pole with nothing illuminating it from behind. That was the thought that haunted me for the rest of that night and continues to do so. This entity slipped behind another tree and vanished down the windrow. For at least five minutes after, not a single word was spoken. Finally, I broke the silence and shifted my gaze from the tree lion to my buddy, who was still lying next to me, and I managed to fumble out. Did you see that? He stammered back with a yes. The rest of that night is quite blurry to me, but we sprinted at full speed to the camper where our friends were. 
We must have looked pale as ghosts, because within minutes, the kids were bombarding us with questions about what was wrong. I don't remember what we said, still reeling from what had just happened, but I recall being very adamant about no one, and I mean no one, going out there, to the point where other kids were beginning to get scared. The next morning I measured where we had seen this being, and it was at least seven foot five tall, even while crouched at the neck. Even then, I was too scared to go to that spot alone. But this isn't where the story ends. It goes on much further. A few years passed, and the friend I had this experience with is now my best friend. We were partying, having a few drinks one night, and this experience came up. We began opening up to each other as close friends do, and I explained to him that I had been plagued by nightmares of this encounter in the past few weeks. His response was far from comforting. He, too, had been experiencing very similar nightmares. In a drunken stupor, we made a pact to call each other the next time we were awakened by these nightmares. Fast forward two weeks, and I wake up panicked, feeling pursued by this entity. I immediately remember our plan, knowing that my friend is the only person I can talk to about this. So I call him, but he goes straight to voicemail. I hang up, and my phone rings instantly with my friend calling me. He's just had the exact same dream at the exact same time. Here's where the story gets eerie and the reason I haven't shared it until now. I've always had odd things happening to me. Supernatural experiences, which I can share another time if you're interested. But at that time, I was 27 and dating a girl in the same town where all of this happened. It was fall, just like when all these other incidents occurred. We were sharing scary stories, and I told her the story I've just shared with you. It was then that I found out what I had seen could be either a wendigo or a skinwalker. My girlfriend and I began delving into these stories about skinwalkers, and she was always amazed that when these stories played or had similarities to mine, she could see a physical reaction from me, such as shivers or very noticeable goosebumps. She always said that this was the most believable evidence, because it's almost impossible to fake. So, while learning about skinwalkers together, we found lore that says once one has seen you, it doesn't stop looking for you. This idea sent shivers down my spine. Additionally, when you speak of them, they become alerted to your presence, and we had been talking a lot about this. I had to leave for work one night, and I was gone the entire night. Our room was in a basement that faced the backyard, which had a broken fence leading out into a large park. While I was gone, my girlfriend had our window open late at night. She was lying in bed when she heard one of her cats meowing loudly toward the broken fence. It wasn't too weird, but the meowing continued, and instead of coming to the window, it persisted. She grew frustrated and turned on a nightlight to say something to the cat. As she approached the window, she realized that the cat she heard meowing was sleeping at the foot of the bed. She slammed the window shut, and thankfully she didn't call for the cat to come inside. She's convinced that it was the same entity attempting to gain access to our house by shape-shifting. This story still haunts me to this day. I fear that by putting it into words, I may open myself to this being and become noticed once more. Please let me know your thoughts on what this creature might be and what I should do, as it seems to come back every couple of years to find me, and it has been a couple of years now. October 2000. It was later in the evening when I was driving back to my in-law's house by myself and was going down a dirt road. I saw something in the ditch up ahead and on the right and didn't really know what it was until I got up far enough so that my headlights could catch it. I didn't know anything about dogmen until a couple of years ago. This thing had an outline of a huge dog, but when I got closer it turned and looked at me. I just floored it. It didn't really bother me until I noticed it looking at me, and I saw that it was actually grasping what it was eating. I got back and didn't say exactly what I saw. I just asked them if they were any big dogs or wolves of where they lived. My father-in-law just laughed and said no. 
Then he asked why I didn't tell him anything. Though the thing I will never forget are those reddish-orange eyes that just kept staring at me deep into my soul. I'm an avid mountain bike rider. Back in July 1995, Sue, my girlfriend at the time, and I took a mountain bike camping vacation from California to Moab, Utah. We had set up camp in the middle of the Moab Desert. We were alone as far as you could see, and you could see across the desert with no obstructions. One night, about an hour into our sleep, we were woken up by something that my brain would not let me accept at the time. We could hear something walking up to our tent and around the general area. We whispered to each other, What the hell is that? The steps were from a two-legged animal. The amount of noise it was making was equivalent to what a large truck would make driving on a crushed rock road. Each time it stepped, you could hear it walking towards the tent, and with just a few steps, it was inches away. At first, we thought maybe it was a person, but no, it's much too big. Maybe a bear. No, it would not be walking with only two legs and with what sounded like long steps. It had to have been at least 600. 800 pounds, by the noise it was making with each step. We were almost frozen with fear as each move we made impaired our hearing. All we could do was monitor this large creature. The fear and hopelessness we felt were off the charts as we heard it slowly step towards our tent, get to within a foot, and then stay there for 10 to 20 minutes, then walk around the campsite for another 10 minutes, and then it left. We couldn't sleep for hours. It's been 25 years, but I remember it like it was yesterday. We pulled up stakes and left the desert the next day. Before we would sleep at night, my girlfriend would question whether I had my Beretta Nanium under my pillow at night. When we camped after that, every night she religiously asked if I had my gun. I remember the next morning we did talk about it. Sue who was Native American, said a few things about it might be a Sasquatch since her people believed in them. At the time, I was just confused. But in hindsight, what we experienced didn't compute. After discussing it, we pretty much concluded we didn't know what the hell it was. But it was freaking big, and we're lucky we are still alive. I was born, raised, and live in Port Alberni, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. As a child growing up here, my grandmother and mother would occasionally tell us stories of individual experiences they had with Sasquatch on their farm back in the 1940s. When it was told to us, I always thought they existed among us. I drive a taxi here in Port Alberni, and one night in early May 2006, around midnight, I was driving back from Sprout Lake with a passenger who was intoxicated but awake in the front passenger seat. We were on the Pacific Rim Highway coming down the hill towards Hector Road when my headlights caught this creature crossing the double line in the road. It was walking kind of hunched over with a hobble to its walk. It had black short fur all over its body with the exception of its face. When the lights of my cab hit his face, I noticed it had very wrinkled light-colored skin on its face. He didn't look at me, so I only saw the side of his face. I noticed it was very skinny, with very large slender hands and feet, with skinny arms and legs. I figured it was seven or eight feet tall. It stood upright, but it was hunched over, so it's hard to tell. It was trying to get to the other side of the road, where there were trees, brush, and a swamp. There were no other vehicles on the road behind me or coming in the other direction. My passenger said to me as we passed the thing, What was that? I said, I think that was a Sasquatch. He said, Are you kidding me? I said, No, that was a Sasquatch. He didn't say anything else on the rest of the ride. I know what I saw, and it wasn't human. The way it walked and how thin it was with its large, thin hands and feet convinced me it wasn't human or anything I'd seen before. I didn't stop when I saw this thing. At the time, the Pacific Rim Highway, or Highway 4, is a major highway that runs through Port Alberni. 
There was a bend in the road, so I didn't want to stop and look where this thing went, as I didn't want to cause a possible accident. Also, it was raining lightly, and it was dark, so I would find it hard to believe someone would be playing a prank on a dark, rainy Saturday night, crossing a major highway in a gorilla suit. Most people at the time were in the local pubs or nightclubs at that time on a Saturday night or at home. I have told a few people about my experiences here in Port Alberni, and one of the Hypocrisy of First Nations people I spoke to about this said it sounds like you saw the old man. She told me a few people over the years, as well as herself on that reserve where I saw it, call it the old man. Well, that's my story. I didn't have any negative feelings about seeing this thing, just surprised. This occurred near New York City in Westchester County very early on the morning of December 30th, 2020. My dad was driving and my mom and I were asleep because it was so late. My dad pulled over and woke us up. He was royally flipping out. We didn't know what was wrong. He pointed to the overpass and all you could see were these intense glowing bright red eyes. At this point we didn't know what it was so we just started driving again. When we reached the overpass, the thing was still on the overpass, so my dad decided to stop. Then the thing swooped down and landed on the hood of our car. This creature landed with such a force it dented the hood. It then proceeded to stand up on the hood and it was six. Seven feet tall, black, and had wide bat-like wings. We were all terrified at this point. My dad takes out the phone and calls the New York Highway Patrol. They laugh at him and hang up saying they didn't like prank calls. The creature was just sitting there. I took out my camera and photographed it with the flash on. The thing then jumped off the car and took off like it was afraid of the camera flash. When we got to my aunt's, we told her and she said there were countless reports of this thing. Then I showed her the picture on my camera and she got really freaked out. I have been doing research over the past couple of weeks and trying to find something that resembles it. At this point, I believe it was a mothman. The crazy thing is that the photo disappeared from my phone a few days later. I had downloaded it on my computer, but that vanished as well. Have you heard of other photos of the mothman vanishing? I was totally freaked out. As I embarked on my solo hike through the pristine winter wilderness, the quiet, untouched snowscape around me was a sight to behold. The crisp, cold air bit at my cheeks, and the untouched snow crunched beneath my size 11-5 hiking boots. I relished the solitude, the beauty of the world blanketed in a pristine layer of white, and the crunch of my footsteps in the snow. Little did I know that this serene experience would soon take a puzzling and eerie turn. I was a seasoned hiker, no stranger to the majesty of the great outdoors, and I often trekked these trails in the colder months. Today the snow was particularly thick, untouched except for the occasional rabbit track. The sun was descending, casting a soft golden light on the surrounding firs, their branches laden with the weight of winter snowfall. As I made my way through the trail, my eyes were drawn to an unusual sight, a set of footprints in the snow, approximately 15 inches long. What perplexed me even more was that they were clearly barefoot. I examined the prints with a growing sense of unease. Their size was enormous, far longer than my own size eleven five boots. I couldn't fathom who would be out here without shoes in these freezing temperatures, and it sent a shiver down my spine. The unsettling discovery of these footprints piqued my curiosity, and I decided to follow them, thinking it might lead to a fellow hiker who needed assistance. As I followed the prints deeper into the forest, I noticed that the once stately fir trees standing at a towering 15 to 20 feet, had all been broken, their tops bent and pointed off the trail. It was a sight that defied the laws of nature and logic. The trail was covered in a thick layer of snow, but I couldn't help but observe that my own footprints only sank in about three to four inches. 
Yet these barefoot prints were far deeper, at least twice as deep into the snow. It was as if the person who made them carried an unimaginable weight. My heart raced as I considered the implications of this eerie discovery. With each step, my unease grew, the cold air that was once refreshing now chilling me to the bone. What could have made these prints, and who was the mysterious barefoot traveler in this desolate winter landscape? A growing sense of foreboding urged me to retrace my steps and make my way back to safety. As I made my way back along the trail, my gaze remained fixed on those haunting footprints in the snow. The mystery of their origin would linger long after I left the winter woods, a strange and unsettling tale that I would recount to fellow adventurers in search of answers. Walking my dog one morning, I noticed strange footprints on the side of the dirt. I looked back jokingly as if I felt something watching me. Nothing, so I keep walking. About five minutes later, I turned to my side because I felt something watching me again. Again, nothing, another three minutes go by, and I glance to my left, and there's something climbing down a tree. I shrug it off, but then I hear a deafening scream as that of a wendigo or skinwalker. I start sprinting back to my house whilst it was chasing me. I made it back just in time while my dog was barking up a flame. I rush him inside, and I notice a wendigo standing outside, holding a body much like a bird. I remember wendigos are scared of fire, so I started to make one in my fireplace. I kept it going all day. My dad is a seafaring tugboat captain. My favorite story he's told me, and there are so many, is when he was in the Arctic, close to the North Pole. Due to the curve of the earth and reflection off the atmosphere, he could see, clear as day, a coastal town in Russia that was hundreds of miles away. More strange than creepy, but here you go. We were fishing on the St. Lawrence River once. We had rented a houseboat and were cruising up and down the river, pulling in pike and having a nice time of it. It was in the middle of the day, hot, humid, and still. My father and I were both on the bow, just trolling and chatting. Suddenly, my toes felt funny. They felt swollen and itchy, and then an intense, burning itch suddenly came over them. Only my ties, mind you. Suddenly, I started bleeding from the cuticles of both my big toes. Not a heavy flow, more like an oozing of blood that lasted all of about five seconds. It stopped as suddenly as it started, and I felt completely fine afterward. But here's the weird part. I turned to tell my father, and he too had blood oozing from the cuticles of his big toes, too. We compared notes and had both experienced the same weird sensation at the same time, and it went away as suddenly as it came for both of us. Same place, same time, same duration. It never happened before and never since. I once asked my doctor about it, and he just shrugged it off, so may... Ex-Canadian Navy, ex-commercial fisherman, now a sea kayaking guide. I have to tell the story here. We were fishing on a salmon trawler off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Off of Nagnat Bar, the area is known for thick fog. The radar broke down and the skipper, fearing a collision with another fishing boat, sent me up the mast to keep a lookout. Once up, I could see above the fog easily, yet could not even see my feet. All was going well. I could see the tall tree on shore and other boats, masts, and with me calling down turns by degrees of helm, we were able to continue fishing. The fog, however, did not burn off, but got thicker and thicker until the guys on deck could not see to work at all. The skipper decided to run back to port and try fix the radar. Since no one was going to be able to fish this opening, we were pretty sure to get another next day. So we turned up to seaward with the plan of just heading south outside the other boats, then turning back in until I could see the tree again and watch for the lighthouse at Port Renfrew. 
We made the turnout, and then we just kept going. I kept yelling down, but no one answered. I could not see what was going on below me, or see well enough to attempt to climb down into the fog. And when I tried, I began to choke on it. After only about 20-30 minutes of heading seaward, we cleared the sea fog near the coast, enough that I was able to see well enough to climb down. The whole crew was collapsed on deck at the bottom of the mast. It appeared they had all tried to climb up, but had been fighting each other. The coroner later ruled the cause of death is drowning. The fog took all of my shipmates. I am the sole survivor of the Ocean Fury tragedy. Edit. This is a story I tell often now as a sea kayaking guide when people ask me why I quit fishing. I come from a small coastal town and it was very common for people to enlist on ships. Both my grandfathers and my father did it, and a whole lot of other men did and do as well. One of my grandmother's friends was a local fisherman. He used to fish the fjords and whatnot with his boat. He used a trawling net connected to a winch to do it. Caught quite a lot. Well, one day he was out doing his usual route. The boat suddenly stopped going forwards, despite the engine still running. He thought that was odd, given how well he knows the area, but he figured he might have caught his net on some rocks or something that he somehow didn't know was there after fishing there for a long time. He tried increasing the power, hoping to dislodge whatever held him in place. But that didn't work. He noticed that not only was he not going forwards, he was in point of fact going backwards and picking up speed. So something was dragging his boat backwards faster than he could move forwards. He thought, what the hell? Is there a submarine under me or what is this? He's a very level-headed guy, you see. Doesn't panic easily. He tried to pull in his nets, but the nets didn't go up. His boat started to go down. At that point, he really started to freak out and cut the nets and set course for home. Before he got far, a gigantic basking shark surfaced right next to the boat. He knew they're not dangerous to humans normally, but well, by the time he got back to town, he was visibly shaking with fear. This is secondhand, so take it with a grain of salt. I've only done minor boating, but some of my gaming buddies are coasties. CK served as an intel officer on the USCGC, but well back when she was on the Bering Sea Patrol. He was on duty on comms on the night that the Arctic Rose went down back in 2001. Fifteen men went down with the Arctic Rose, and they only ever found one body, the captain, and he wasn't even fully in his survival suit. It was the worst loss that has been suffered in those waters in this century. So about two years later, they're back on the EMBL station, and this time, they're helping locate the wreck using an ROV, trying to gather some sense of what caused her to sink so fast. They're moving the ROV about, trying to get it below decks. My friend is watching the feed as the ROV is being piloted. In his words, I saw a skeletal arm suddenly move across the video screen. I don't mean just floating remains. It was moving in an animated fashion. Then we lost the feed officially. The ROV had got caught below deck in an obstacle that we were unable to extract it from. But unofficially, every year on the straight, Sedna takes her toll. Sometimes mild, sometimes heavy, but Sedna has her price for letting men fish those seas. Sedna keeps those whom she takes. Avid deep sea fisherman here. I fish the east side of Florida quite a bit. We will go 25, 100 miles out to fish reefs or structure on the bottom. We also trolled quite a bit. One time we were trolling for kingfish and hooked up onto something massive on a downrigger. When I mean massive, I mean huge. Whatever we had on was peeling, dragged like nothing. We figured we hooked into a porpoise until a mako about eight, ten feet long jumped around thirty yards from the boat. That shark jumped three more times until it frayed our leader enough to snap it. 
We never thought we would catch a mako that big, especially on the troll. We also find rafts all the time. We found rafts made out of tires, PVC, foam, wood, and even four kayaks zip-tied together with wooden planks. Tied to the top of them, most of the rafts we find look like they have just been used also, which is pretty eerie. Another time on the west coast of Florida, I was spearfishing off a rig and the water was crystal clear. There was zero wind, so I could see pretty far in the water around the rig. Let me tell you, it's quite scary when you can just make out the shadow of a shark, right? Then it disappears in waters below. Most of the sharks we see around the rigs, too, are huge hammerheads. These hammerheads can get massive. I speared a mangrove snapper and one of these hammerheads came and ripped it right off my spear. This was moments right after I shot it, too. This happened yesterday when me and Dad were alone at home. His room is in the third floor and mine in the second. He leaves every day after his afternoon lunch and leaves his room door opened with a key on the inside of the door. When he comes back in the evening, we found out the door is closed and locked from the inside. We thought Mom came and closed it, but she said she didn't and she was at my aunt's all day. We started to freak out because this is beyond normal. The room has a toilet and windows to the roof, so I climbed and got to the room through the windows to find the door is really locked, and the key is inside. There is no one that could sneak in from the windows because there was no one at home, and we have a third floor house, so no one can go inside if it is not from the main door. Does anyone have any explications to this? My dad worked in the timber industry his whole life. His father was a logger, and he grew up in and around the woods. My dad started his own logging company when he was 18 and has owned and operated shake and shingle mills from Oregon clear up to Thorn Bay, Aska. He is an intelligent man and holds over a dozen patents for various pieces of equipment he has designed and built over the years. He has employed dozens of people over the years, all of them spending extensive time in the wilderness. When I was a boy, I remember hearing bits and pieces of conversations among some of the men at the mill. Although nobody would tell me directly, I understood that something had gone on before I was born, and it involved one of the foremen, Joan. They weren't joking around, they were genuinely afraid and wouldn't talk about it with a kid. When I was young, my dad wouldn't tell me about it because I would often go out into the woods cutting blocks with him on the weekends, and he didn't want me to be afraid of the woods. While I was speaking with him last weekend, I told him of a couple of strange events that happened to me later in the wilderness, and that reminded me of the hints at a story I heard when I was a boy. After some prodding, he told me the following story. In the mid-1960s, my dad owned a large roofing product mill in Aberdeen. Way. He had teams of men that would cut the fallen old-growth cedar salvage left after a logging operation. He had permits to salvage a large amount of wood in the coastal areas of Grays Harbor County, primarily in the area around Copales Beach. Several of the men on his cutting crews lived in and around Copales Beach. His foreman... A man I will call Joan for the story was a bright, down-to-earth hard worker. My dad trusted him with thousands of dollars of vehicles and equipment, as well as the safety of his crews. He was not the kind of man to make up stories. On a Monday morning sometime in July, John was several hours late for work. This was highly unusual as he was always there early, getting the saws and trucks ready for the day. My dad said he was visibly shaken up, and when he asked him what was wrong, he asked my dad to go in the office so the others wouldn't hear them. They went in and sat down, and Joan simply said something destroyed our house this weekend. My dad thought he said someone broke into the house and asked John if it was someone he knew. Joan said, you don't understand. This wasn't a person. It was a, I don't know what it was, but it completely trashed the house. The family is going to stay with my brother in Elma for a while. My dad asked him to explain what had happened. 
John said that when he got home from work Friday evening, his youngest son, Tim, who was around four at the time, told him he saw a big cowman walking at the edge of their field that afternoon. He thought the boy meant cowboy because some of his neighbors wore cowboy hats when they were out in the sun. He asked him if the man was wearing a cowboy hat, and the boy said, no, daddy, he was a cowman, furry and stinky like the cows. He asked his wife if she knew what he was talking about, and she said Tim was playing on the porch that afternoon when he came running in and said the cowman was stuck on the fence. He was very excited, so she went out to see what he was talking about. She said as she opened the door, she was hit by a horrible smell like wet dogs and garbage. Tim was pointing across to the field opposite their house and said he got loose. She looked where he was gesturing and could see the top strand of barbed wire bouncing up and down, as if somebody had just pulled on it really hard and let it go. She didn't see the cowman and noticed nothing out of the ordinary except for the smell. She told Tim to come inside to play for the rest of the day. She felt uneasy and a little scared. Their older son... Joan Jr., who was 12 at the time, was at a friend's house and walked home a short while after Tim saw his cowman. He told her somebody had followed him home, walking in the woods off the right side of the road. He never seen who it was. They never left the woods, but he said it had to be a really big man. He would hear large sticks cracking, and the footsteps were very heavy. Once he got to the driveway of their house where the woods stopped at the field where his brother had his sighting, the footsteps stopped and Joan Jr. never saw anything. He was pretty shaken up by the event and wanted his dad to go out to the woods and check it out with him. Later that evening, John strapped on his 357 and took his older son out into the field to have a look. They first walked to the area where the cowman was supposedly stuck on the fence and walked down the fence line looking for anything. They came upon a large clump of long reddish-brown hair tangled in the top strand of barbed wire. He tried to pull it off, but it was really tangled up, so he pulled out his buck knife and sawed it off. He said the hair was over a foot long, real coarse and stringy. There appeared to be a bit of flesh matted in the clump, and the top wire was pulled loose from one of the posts. Whatever was hung up on the fence was very big. He handed the hair to his son to hold, and they climbed through the fence and walked toward the woods. He said he was looking for any sign of tracks on the ground. The hair kind of looked like it was from a horse's mane or tail. The ground was a solid, grassy field, and there were no hoof prints or any other tracks he could see. The edge of the woods began about ten feet from the fence line, and they entered on a small game trail that deer frequented. It was around eight at night, and in the woods it was getting to be fairly dark. They walked for a ways and soon began to smell the rotting garbage or wet dog odor his wife reported earlier. John said he got the feeling they were being watched. The hair on the back of his neck was standing up. He told his son they should head back before it got dark, and the boy didn't argue. As they began walking back out, they could hear heavy footsteps off to their left. They stopped, and the footsteps stopped. They walked on, nearly to the clearing, and Joan whispered to his son to run like hell to the house on the count of three. John Jr. nodded, and John whispered, One, two, three, and gave his son a push in the back to get him started, then spun around and raced off the trail in the opposite direction, toward the footsteps with his gun drawn. Off the trail, the underbrush was dense with ferns and bushes. He had a hard time making headway, but as he got closer, he could hear it moving away from him, deeper into the woods. At this time, he told my dad that he thought it was a vagrant camping out in the woods and possibly scoping houses out to rob at night. John was a big man and capable of taking care of himself in most any situation, and he had a large caliber handgun, so he wasn't too worried about confronting a vagrant in the woods. He was a few yards off the trail in deep brush when he heard the movement stop just ahead of him. He stopped to look and listen, and thought he saw movement by a large tree like someone was trying to hide there. He leveled his gun and said, Come out nice and slow or I swear to God I'll come back there and shoot you. It was silent for a moment, and then he caught movement out the corner of his eye and spun around to his right for a better look. He said it looked like a huge bear moving through the brush. 
He could only see bits of it through the dense ferns, but it was moving quietly away from the tree on four legs. It was about fifteen feet away from him. At first he thought it was a bear, and then suddenly he saw a huge hairy arm with a human-like hand reach out of the brush and grab a small alder tree. The tree was about four inches in diameter, and it grabbed hold about five feet up. He said it happened so fast it was a blur, but the thing pulled itself upright out of the brush by holding the tree. It stood on two legs and turned its upper body to glare at John. It was enormous. He couldn't believe how bulky it was. He said it was well over seven feet tall and at least half that big through the chest. It was too dark to make out many features, but its eyes seemed to glow a deep red, and he thought he could see teeth like it was curling its lips back. It stood for just a brief moment and then lunged ahead, pushing back on the tree with tremendous force. The tree snapped loudly and crashed into the trees around it, getting hung up in the branches and not falling to the ground. It then disappeared into the deep brush with frightening speed, sounding like a bulldozer with no engine sounds. Joan stood there in shock, his gun temporarily forgotten, and then he realized it was heading toward the house, the way his son had went. He turned and ran to the trail, hoping to gain ground on it and cut it off before it reached the clearing. He hit the trail and ran as fast as he could toward the clearing, all the while hearing the creature thrash through the brush on his side. He burst into the clearing and looked frantically about for his son. John Jr. was standing just inside of the fenced field, waiting for his dad. John screamed at him to run to the house. Then he saw the thing crash out of the woods about fifty feet to his left. It crossed the ten-foot clearing and stepped over the fence in two strides and was running through the field parallel to his son in a matter of seconds. John screamed at his son to run faster and took aim at the creature. He didn't fire because he was afraid to hit his son or his house, so he vaulted over the fence and ran in pursuit of them. He could see it angling toward his son and knew there was no way his boy would make it to the gate before it cut him off. In desperation, he pointed the gun to the ground at his side and fired as he ran, hoping to scare it. It veered more sharply toward his son and put on an enormous burst of speed. He heard his boy scream as they seemed to collide. He saw the creature dip its shoulder down a little bit, and suddenly Joan Jr. was airborne. He flew about ten feet, then hit the ground rolling. The creature never paused. It continued to run at an amazing speed in a loop back towards the woods. Once the line of fire was clear, John stopped and squeezed off the remaining five rounds at the retreating creature. He was pretty sure all the shots went wild. The creature never made a sound or slowed down and was soon over the fence and back in the woods. He reached his son, who was shaken up but not physically hurt. He asked his dad if it was a bear. Apparently, little John was so busy running for the house that he didn't see the creature running after him. He said something big and black suddenly ran into him, and he felt a huge paw hit his bottom. And he said he felt like he was falling. Joan pulled his son to his feet, and they ran through the gate and into the house, locking the door behind him. They were both out of breath and white as ghosts. His wife was screaming at him, demanding to know what the gunshots were for and if they were all right. When he could catch his breath, he told her to make sure the back door was locked. He was going to call the sheriff. He went to the phone and began to dial the number. This was before 911. Then stopped and wondered what exactly he was going to say. He hung up the phone, realizing what an idiot he would look like if he told the sheriff the boogeyman just chased them out of the woods. He told his wife that it was a large animal, possibly a bear. He didn't know how to begin to tell her their four-year-old was right. His cowman was real, and it was more frightening than anything he could imagine. He told them all to keep the doors locked and stay away from the windows. Around ten o'clock that night, both boys were in bed, and Joan and his wife sat down to watch the news. They soon heard a loud, moaning cry, kind of like the siren on the volunteer fire department. It would stretch out for a long time and then end with a whoop-whoop sound. It was coming from the woods opposite the house. His wife asked, what the hell is that? Joan answered truthfully. That is Tim's cowman. He then described to her the full details of what had happened, and she immediately wanted to call the sheriff.
He persuaded her that they would sound crazy and that he would handle it himself. She reluctantly agreed and told him she didn't want either of the kids to go outside until this thing was gone. The howling went on until around midnight when it got quiet again. John wanted to stay up through the night and watch over the house, but he had a long day at work and the excitement earlier had worn him out. They went to bed around one in the morning and had no further problems that night. They slept in that morning and the boys were already up and watching cartoons when they got out of bed. The first thing little John said was that he had heard the bear rubbing against the house last night. He said he was too scared to get up and tell his parents and fell back asleep soon after. Then Tim said the cowman talks funny. This stopped John cold. He asked his son, When did you talk to the cowman? Tim replied last night in my room. John asked, The cowman was in your room. No, Daddy, he's too big for my room. He talked to my window, Tim said, and turned back to the cartoons. What did the cowman say? Tim, John asked. He talks funny. I don't know what he said. He talks like this. Oh, ah, oh, oh, Tim said and started making strange monkey-like noises. Did the cowman try to get in your window? John asked, breaking out in a cold sweat. He's too big for that. He made funny faces. He has Lincoln log teeth, Tim said with a smile. John later learned Tim meant it had square teeth that looked the same size as the small blocks in a Lincoln log set. It apparently spent quite a while talking and making faces outside the boy's window. Tim said it lay down and went to sleep outside, and he could hear it snoring. John walked to his younger son's room and cautiously peered out the window. No sleeping cowman, John told the boys to get dressed. They were going to go visit their uncle and Elma for the day. After his wife and kids left, he called one of the men from his crew and asked him to come over. I'll call him Patrick. He was an ex-state patrolman, and my dad said he was kicked off the force because of his drinking problem. He was a good worker and never got drunk before dark, so John figured they would have most of the day to look for this thing. When Patrick arrived, John greeted him at the door and said, Are you up for some hunting? Seeing how it was not hunting season, Patrick told him he doesn't poach and doesn't even want to know about it if John did. John told him it wasn't deer he was after and went on to explain the previous night's events. Patrick didn't really believe him but could see he was sincere and still shook up. John had his pistol and uh, bolt action 30.6. Patrick had a 38 in his car and John loaned him a 12 gauge. They first circled the house looking for any signs of a nocturnal visitor. At the back of the house there was a spigot for the garden hose and it always leaked. There was a patch of ground worn bare of grass under it, and it had turned to mud. In the center of the mud, there was a huge clear imprint of what looked like a bare human foot. John said it was at least 18 inches long and very wide. It was so clear that he got the feeling it was left there on purpose. They found no other prints around the house and in places in the field and woods where a track could be made, the creature seemed to avoid them off to the side of the track in the mud were four straight lines about eight inches long. He said it looked like someone had raked their fingers through the mud. When they circled around the side of the house and got to Tim's window, they saw what it was for. Above the top of the window, a good seven feet up, were four muddy streaks, and on the window itself were dozens of large muddy fingerprints. The glass wasn't cracked or broken, just smeared with mud. By this time, Patrick was fast becoming convinced something strange had indeed happened the night before. Before going out into the woods, John wanted to feed the family's pigs. They had two of them, apparently fairly young, weighing around 40 pounds each. The pig pen was about a hundred yards away from the house, behind an old barn. As they got closer, John became concerned because they couldn't hear them making any noise. Usually, they squealed like crazy when they knew food was near at hand, but this morning it was completely silent. They rounded the corner and the pen was empty. No sign of damage or struggle. The pigs were just gone. They searched the barn but found nothing out of place, so they decided to hit the woods and try to kill this thing. They entered on the same trail John and John had used the day before, 
John showed Patrick the broken fence wire and told him again about the hair. It was a bright summer morning, and John was surprised at the difference from the previous evening. The night before had been still and silent. Now the woods were alive with birds and small animals. He showed Patrick the broken tree, and they followed the creature's trail and found several more trees and large branches twisted and broken. They could see large, faint impressions of footprints where the ground was soft. They followed the deer trail further into the woods and encountered nothing unusual. By noon, they were both getting hungry, so they hiked back to the house for lunch. They spent the rest of the day poking around, but saw nothing more out of the ordinary. Just before dark that night, his wife and kids drove up. He and Patrick were sitting on the porch with the guns, watching the woods. His wife asked if they had seen anything. John told her about the footprint and mud on the window. Patrick had retrieved a pint of booze from his car and was well on his way to getting smashed. John decided he didn't want a frightened drunk with a gun around his family, so he suggested that Patrick could go home. Nothing was going to happen anyway. Patrick agreed and drove off, and Joan continued to watch the woods. His wife brought out a plate of food and a Coleman lantern and a flashlight. He told her he would stay out here and watch the house through the night. Before they went to bed, he went into their bedroom and, with help from his wife, pushed the king-sized bed as far from the windows as they could. They agreed that his wife and kids would all sleep in that bed for the night, and he would keep watch around the house. She had grown up hunting and knew how to handle a gun as good as him, so she insisted on keeping the shotgun in the room with them. He agreed after making her promise to ask for a name before shooting anything. If it replied, John, please don't shoot it. There was a full moon that night, and John could see across the field and into the inky dark of the woods. The night air was filled with the sound of thousands of crickets, and the pond behind the house was full of croaking frogs. As the moon rose higher, clumps of weeds in the field began casting sinister shadows, and before long John was seeing big hairy creatures sneaking up on him, and each of them, he stood up and lit a cigarette, trying to shake the fear and concentrate on the task at hand. As he smoked, he wandered to the end of the porch and stood looking at the darkened barn. Something was different, but he couldn't quite place it. The front of the barn facing the house was open, and the moonlight was hitting it from the side, casting the interior in deep shadows. He stood watching the black opening as he finished his smoke, thinking about the missing pig. He then realized what was wrong. All the crickets and frogs had gone silent. It was as quiet as the inside of a mausoleum at night. He could hear the minute shrill buzz of his own nervous system. As he turned to walk back to his chair, he thought he saw movement in the barn. He looked intently at the opening and could make out nothing, then turned his head a bit to the side and saw what looked like two red eyes hovering about eight feet off the ground. He couldn't see them if he looked straight at them, but when he averted his eyes a little, they became clearer. They were a deep burning coal red, almost invisible in the dark. Every few seconds they would disappear when the creature blinked. His heart began thudding in his chest, and he waited for it to leave the barn and approach the house. He slowly backed up to his chair, never looking away, and picked up his thirty point six. He walked back to the end of the porch and watched and waited. He stood looking at the blinking red eyes for what seemed like hours, and then the eyes blinked out and never came back. He watched intently but could see no movement. He thought for a moment, then grabbed the flashlight and shined it at the barn. The flashlight was too small to penetrate the darkness of the barn from this distance. He had to get closer. He was none too keen about leaving the relative safety of the porch and confronting a glowing-eyed monster in his barn but he was damned if he was going to live in fear in his own house. He left the porch and began slowly working his way toward the barn, taking his time, building his courage up. He got closer and could still see no movement. It had gone further into the dark. He got within twenty feet of the opening, and his flashlight would now penetrate the gloom in the barn. He moved the feeble beam of light over the contents of the barn, an old tractor, and old pickup boxes and buckets. Too many places for something to hide, even something big. He cautiously walked closer, now shining the flashlight down the barrel of his rifle. 
He stopped at the entrance and shined the light all over, searching the corners and under the vehicles. He stepped into the barn, every sense straining for sound or movement. He walked around the pickup, tensing for a huge, hairy arm to reach out and grab him at any second. He made his way clear to the rear of the barn without seeing anything, and slowly turned around to leave. He felt both relieved not to have encountered it in the dark barn and frightened and somewhat confused about where it could have gone. As he was walking out, he glanced at the wide stairs leading up into the hayloft and froze. He knew with complete certainty that it had climbed those stairs and was waiting for him to walk out under the hayloft and jump down upon him. He couldn't move. He was literally frozen in fear. He swore he could hear the floorboard softly creak above him as an enormous weight edged stealthily closer to the edge. He stood with his heart pounding in his ears, unable to move or act. Suddenly there was a booming explosion of a shotgun from the house, followed by his wife screaming. His paralysis broke and he bolted out of the barn toward the house, completely forgetting what may have been in the hayloft. As he ran toward the house, he heard an inhuman roar coming from the woods behind the house. It sounded pissed off and in pain. It screamed again, and he heard branches breaking as it plowed through the forest, thankfully away from the house. He got to the house and almost knocked down the front door in his hurry to get inside. He ran down the hall to their room and found his family huddled together on the bed, sobbing. One of the windows was blown out, and his wife was still pointing the shotgun at it. When he burst into the room, she swung the gun in his direction and screamed, and he hit the floor. He waited for the blast, but it didn't come. He slowly stood up, and she had put the gun down, and he went to the bed. He asked her what had happened, but she was too shook up to answer just then. Tim started crying. Why did you shoot the cowman, Mommy? Why? John Jr. had his face buried against her shoulder, crying. After they calmed down a bit, he told them to get up and follow him. He led them to the living room, then went out the open front door and looked carefully around. He could see no sign of it. All was quiet again. He told them to come out and get in the car. They ran out in their pajamas and piled in the car. He got in and drove them to his brother's house in Elma. On the way there, they had calmed down enough to tell him what happened. She said a couple hours after they went to bed, she finally dozed off. She was awakened by Tim talking to someone and this bizarre clicking, chirping sound. Tim wasn't in the bed. He was standing in front of one of the windows. The moonlight was shining through both windows, illuminating the room pretty good. But there was a large shadow, like a tree obscuring the window in front of Tim. She knew there were no trees close enough to cast a shadow. She told to get away from the window. Mommy, listen. The cowman can sound like a bird. Tim said, pointing excitedly at the dark figure in the window. Timmy, get away from the window, she said, trying to keep her voice quiet. Right after she spoke, the noises from outside changed. It went from a soft chirping to a strange gibbering, almost like human speech with an occasional pig-like snort thrown in. At this time, little John woke up and said, What is that? rather loudly. This seemed to incite the creature, and it hit the side of the house with its fists hard enough for the walls to tremble. At this, little John screamed, and Tim yelled, Quiet! You're going to scare him away! She yelled at Tim to get away from the window again and reached up on the headboard and grabbed the shotgun. She got out of the bed and started toward Tim. The creature leaned down and looked straight in the window at her. She screamed and raised the shotgun, afraid to shoot because her son was so close to it. She started for word to grab Tim, and there was an explosion of breaking glass. A gigantic hairy arm reached through the window toward her son. She screamed again and fired over Tim's head, blowing out the rest of the window and hitting the creature with a zero buckshot. It jerked backwards out of the window and disappeared into the dark. A few seconds later, she heard it screaming in the woods. It was trying to get Tim. It was trying to grab my baby. She started crying again, and he comforted her as best he could while driving. They stayed the rest of that night and the following night with his brother's family. He told his brother about it, but could see he didn't really believe him. He agreed to ride back to Joan's house with him early Monday morning before work. They had left the front door open in their haste to leave, and he was afraid animals or vandals would have gotten to the house. 
When they arrived, the house looked like a tornado had gone through it. The couch was upside down. They had a large, heavy console TV, and it was apparently thrown across the room, laying in a spray of broken glass. The kitchen was trashed. The refrigerator knocked over and food everywhere. The doors to both of the boys' rooms were left closed, and the rooms were untouched, same as the bathroom. The master bedroom was torn apart. The pillows ripped up and feathers everywhere. The chest of drawers was knocked over, and the large mirror smashed. John's brother looked around in awe and said, You better call the police. John looked at him and said, and Tell him what? Bigfoot destroyed my house. They left and closed the front door this time and drove to my dad's mill in Aberdeen. John's brother waited in the car while John went in and told this to my dad. After he was done, my dad said, Well, let's go have a look at it then. They drove back out to the house and John showed my dad the damage. He pulled the clump of hair from his shirt pocket and let my dad look at it. As they were walking through the house, surveying the damage, my dad pointed out cracks in the ceiling where it had apparently stood up and hit its head. John told my dad that they couldn't live there anymore, even if the creature was gone. They would always be afraid. Their homeowner's insurance wouldn't cover the damage. The adjuster claimed John must have done it in a drunken rage. My dad helped them find a place in Aberdeen and gave him a loan for new furniture and stuff. The house was eventually fixed up and sold, and my dad never heard about another problem there. A few observations about this story. My dad lost contact with John and his family in the mid-80s. They moved out of state, and my dad hasn't heard from them since. His brother died around the same time. Why didn't they call the cops? John had a lot of pride as well as a lot of common sense. He knew he couldn't logically explain what had happened to the authorities, and he didn't want the story to get out and have him branded a nutcase. I asked my dad if they saved the hair. He said John never mentioned it again, and my dad never asked him about it. I asked my dad if he saw the footprint and muddy fingerprints. He said he did. He said it looked like a giant barefoot man had stepped very carefully in the center of the mud. He's not a tracker, but he said it was the clearest print of any kind he had ever seen. I asked my dad if the neighbors had heard any of this. He said if they did, none of them ever mentioned it again. I also asked him if he thought it was possible John had made it all up. That he had trashed his house in a drunken rage and made up this elaborate cover story. My dad said John and his family were terrified of that place. They didn't even want to go back and get their clothes. If it was just an elaborate story, what did he stand to gain? To profit from a story in any way? You have to share it with people. My dad and the other folks mentioned in the story are the only ones who ever heard it. Until now, of course. He also said that whatever trashed that house was no man. The TV had to have weighed close to 200 pounds, and it was obviously thrown across the room with great force. He said that even after two days, there was still a wild animal smell in the house. I asked him if thought there might have been two creatures involved, considering the incident in the barn. He said he asked John that same question, and was told that Joan felt there was only one, that it lured him into the barn, then snuck out the side door to the house. The thing he thought he heard in the hayloft was either his imagination or some common animal like a raccoon. For whatever reason, this critter seemed focused on their four-year-old son. Their son was the only one who never showed any fear of it. He seemed to think of it as his friend. And although the sex of the animal was never determined, it was referred to as a male because of the predatory stalking type behavior. That and the conspicuous lack of breasts, or perhaps it was just not as well endowed as the Patterson film subject. Anyhow, its behavior almost seems indicative of a mother that has lost her little Bigfoot and is looking for a replacement. I rather facetiously asked my dad if little Timmy was a particularly hairy child, perhaps suffering from that rare condition that causes uncontrollable hair growth all over the body. He said Timmy was a normal little boy with normal brown hair on his normal head. 
I didn't ask if Timmy regularly reeked of rotting garbage and wet dogs. Didn't seem a polite course for the conversation to take. He told me of other possible Bigfoot encounters he and his crews had in the woods around Gray's Harbor. None of them are quite as titillating as the cowman story, but interesting nonetheless. Perhaps I'll share them if there is an interest here in them. So in the end, I was left with no leads to follow, no new evidence of anything. But I did come away with a pretty damn good story. And I guess that's better than a poke in the eye with a filthy and crusted hypodermic needle. Those of you who actually read this far, I give you a big thumbs up. You are truly an ardent and stoic follower of all things Bigfoot, or like me, recently underemployed and in desperate need to fill the endless, empty hours of your life. Back when I was younger, I did some survey work for a logging company in Alaska, as I was fit and liked to hike. They sent me in first to check out the terrain and figure out the best ways into the area they wanted to harvest. I always traveled light, just a backpack with a United States Army mess kit, some MRS, a few spare clothes, a fire kit, a bivouac sack and axe, a knife some bear spray and my late granddad's revolver. I also used to cut me a nice thick hiking stick. With all that gear packed, I set out on foot. The first night was largely very quiet, and I got a good night's sleep. Only one time I woke up to what I thought was the wind rustling through the trees, and I didn't think much of it. The next day, I arrived at the designated logging area and started to do my work. Around noon, I started to get that eerie feeling of being watched. I had had this feeling before, but I always blamed my imagination for it. Well, it grew more and more over the day. Right when I was about to set up camp for the night, I heard some rustling in the brush again and caught a glimpse of something big huddling out of sight. Needless to say, I skipped setting up the camp and booked it out of there. I walked about ten miles until I was too tired to move on. The feeling of being watched had stopped, and I deemed it safe to set up my camp. I woke up in the morning, and the first thing I saw were bear tracks of what I think was a huge grizzly going all over my campsite. I have never broke up the camp this fast again. I made sure my revolver was loaded and within arm's reach at all times and kept my bear spray at the ready on the way back, but nothing happened anymore. I told the logging company about my encounter, and they said they will take the necessary precautions. A few months later, when the logging operation was in full swing, a worker was attacked by what was later described as a huge male grizzly bear. A year or so later, hunters in that area shot one of the biggest grizzlies I have ever seen, and judging by the size of its paws, it could have been that very bear stalking me on that hike. was driving through Alaska trying to get to Haines to take the ferry to Washington. Stopped at this small town bar to ask for directions to a place to spend the night. Everyone in the bar turned and looked at me like I was an alien from outer space. The older lady offered to give me lodging for free for a price. Wink, wink. I was a fit soldier that just left the military, so I guess I was extremely attractive at the time. I knew from the safety briefings that STDs were prevalent in the area, so I said, uh, that's fine, I'll find some place down the road. You're good, thanks. Anyway, I found this abandoned quarry and set up my tent next to this vehicle that had bullet holes all over it, shotgun to hell. When I settled down into the sleeping bag, I heard these footsteps from above the half crater I was in. I took out my knife and placed it over my neck under the sleeping bag and tried to go to sleep, but my hypervigilance was activated too far, and there was no way to see outside the tent. I had too much stuff in the car people would want, so I packed up the tent and drove down the road. I slept on the turnoff in the car overnight and woke up to a nice sunrise over the mountain range. Myself and a few others were camped at a spot called Ray Lakes in California. We, 
being reasonable persons, do not hike at night, but we were sat by our campfire watching a night hiker's headlamp come steadily down and down and down along switchbacks, which awaited us the next day. Our concerns were, why the F would a person with a tent on their back willingly hike at night, and that we had caught six fish when the limit was five. Once the stranger reached our camp, it turned out he ran with a crew that saw the Sierra Club, his right wing. He was interested in killing all the trout in the high Sierra lakes so that a natural stasis of loud-ass frogs and mosquitoes, of which there are entirely too many in my opinion, could regain dominance over the land. This March I went hiking or camping with some friends and there was one guy who's never been before. We decided to set up camp once the sun had gone down and we got tired. New guy comments on how it's weird that there's so much dew on the ground when it hasn't rained. When our headlamps hit the ground, sure enough, there's millions of tiny glowing dots of reflection covering almost every inch of the ground, like morning dew. I point out the daw is glowing red and tell him to look closer. He learned three things that night. He learned why we use camp hammocks instead of traditional tents. He learned that wolf spider eyes glow red when hit with bright light. And most importantly, he learned that he doesn't like being in the woods at night. When I was 15 or 16, I lived in a very rural area. I'm talking wooded areas right in my backyard, complete with all the flora and fauna that goes with them. I loved to go out back and walk the paths in the forest right after the sun went down, but right before it got too dark. I would always take large sticks with me, hinking sticks, as the wildlife there could be dangerous. I would also take my dog sometimes. I lived in a place with a few neighbors who had a lot of land, mostly so their wildlife could graze, so besides the few times my neighbors went out to get cattle or other stuff, we were pretty much left alone. That day I had my dog and one of my favorite sticks with me. Yes, I had favorite hiking sticks. Don't judge. It was getting late, but I didn't want to go inside despite the rapidly darkening sky. I decided I would take the long way out of the forest, so I steered my dog onto a trail that I only took when I wanted to go right by the river. It went by the bank and then straight into a thick set of brush, a thicket where deer love to ritz and graze. I wasn't afraid of deer. They usually left us alone and seemed to dislike my dog, so I didn't think anything was off when I felt like I was being watched, just animals being animals. But as I advanced into the thicket, my dog began to growl low in her throat, and I began to freak out. I have panic attacks a lot, especially in very tense situations. Now, with growing fear and the feeling that some hand was off, I urged my dog to run. She did. I went straight after her, running faster than I ever have before. I don't exactly remember what happened, but I remember that I tripped and fell close to the edge of the thicket. I looked up and saw something I will never forget. In the shadows of the thicket, something was staring at me with bright yellow eyes. It looked like the shadow of a man, but I don't know what it was. It seemed a bit off. I can't recall its exact features, but when I saw it, a feeling of terror so horrible and intense engulfed me. A feeling that gave me two options. Run or cower. There was not fight. I knew I could not win. I was going to cower. I was not going to move. But my dog had other plans. She dragged me, dragged me right out of that thicket. And onto my feet I've never ran so fast in my life. It was a primal instinct, one I could not obey. I didn't go into the forest for a month after that. Even then, I was never fully comfortable. I never told anyone about my encounter. Only a few close friends who scoff at me. But I swear, that night I saw something. I don't know what, but I do know that I saw it. And although I have had few nightmares featuring it, I believe it is the most terrifying experience I have ever had.
something's out here with us. Last weekend, one of my friends brought up the idea of camping. At first, I was opposed to it as it's fall and cold outside and the idea of having to sleep in a tent with another person just didn't seem appealing. But when all five of us talked about it, I realized that maybe it wasn't such a bad idea after all. We decided to do it next weekend. Okay, now. This morning, we went out and bought everything we needed. Tents, snakes, a lighter, and a couple of more things that don't need mentioning. We decided it would be best to do it in the woods two hours away from any road or houses. I was particularly upset about that as anything could happen from some random person attacking us to a bear sneaking in our tents. But we'd have our car parked on the nearest road, so if anything did happen, we could just run to it. At least that's what some others said. I brought up the fact it's a two-hour walk, but of course I was ignored. We drove as far as we could before we got out to start walking. I noticed a few things. First of all, no sound of wildlife. No crickets, no birds. No, nothing making sound. And it felt odd, like something was slightly off. I chalked it up to my nerves acting up and ignored it. Where should we set the rents up at? Rob asked, taking a puff of his joint. Right over there. Looks good, Nate replied, motioning for Rob to pass it to him. Who's setting it up? After a little conversation, we decided Dan and Murphy could do it while the rest of us goes out to see if we can find any squirrels to hunt. I doubted it. It didn't exactly seem like this place was crawling with wildlife. Grab my riffle, would ya? I grabbed it and threw it at him. Don't worry, it wasn't loaded yet. He catches it, saying a quick thanks, and off we went. We were out for hours looking to no avail. There was absolutely nothing. I didn't even see any bugs. Maybe we should go on back now. We can eat the stuff we brought. I suggested. Rob and Nate stopped walking, to which I assumed meant they agreed. We turned back around and started walking back towards camp. A couple of minutes of walking, I heard a sound. It was quiet, but we all heard it. We stopped walking to look around. Behind us, there was a deer. Except, it wasn't normal. Its horns were growing out of its mouth, and it had five legs. I had never seen anything like it before, but I've heard of it. Deformed deers, I wasn't too worried. We decided not to kill it because we definitely weren't about to eat it, being too worried about catching some type of disease. I wondered, though, how long has that deer been following us, being so silent that we hadn't even noticed it. We made it back to camp about an hour later. We ended up eating some cans of chili we brought with us. We cooked it over the fire we made. The five of us were sharing tents, two in one and three in another. I was sharing with Nate. Robert, Murphy, and Dan were in the other. We stayed up for a few more hours singing songs and drinking beer before we headed off to bed. I fell asleep about an hour after laying down. Click, 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 click. I woke up to a clicking noise. It took me a second to register what was happening. I assumed it was one of the guys doing something, but just in case, I grabbed my gun and unzipped the tent. I froze. The deer from before was standing outside my tent, its mouth moving weirdly. Its teeth were clicking against each other every few seconds from the weird movement. It followed us all the way back. How did we not notice? I zipped the tent back and tried to ignore it. Needless to say, I got no sleep that night. The next morning, all six of us decided to stay one more thing before packing up to leave. It was weird. I felt like something was messing with my mind, that my brain wasn't working correctly. I was scared I just didn't know what of. Me, Dan, Nate, Robert, Murphy, and wait, and what was I talking about? There was only five, no, six of us. Wait, six? Never mind, it's not important. I spent all evening wondering what was wrong with my mind. I could tell the others felt the same way. That night all six of us went to sleep, three in one and three in another. I was with Nate and someone, something felt wrong, but I just couldn't put my foot on it. That night I woke up to the same clicking noise as last night, this time from inside the tent. I was too scared to move had the deer somehow made it into the tent. However, I felt Nate shift to get up. What? 
I heard him say before he went silent, cutting off whatever he was about to say. What the hell? I heard him say again, slightly louder this time. I felt something move on my left side, which was strange because Nate was on my right side. Oh, oh, shit, I heard before I felt someone leap over me onto Nate. I woke up the next morning panting. Was it all a dream? I wondered. All five of us packed up to leave. Something still felt wrong. No. One of us felt wrong. Nate was off. He talked the same and acted the same, but it was the way he looked. Have you ever heard of Uncanny Valley? Like that, I know something was off, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. I ignored it, and with that, all five of us walked to the car, got in and took off. I couldn't help but feel like I made a mistake, like I was about to unleash something unholy into the town we live in, like I did something bad. In August 1993, I was a deputy sheriff in Pierce County, Washington. I was a part of a search for a missing hiker. We had split up into single searchers early into the investigation. I was assigned to an area near Evans Creek Preserve. This area was state land, but adjacent to federal land. It was approximately 2.15 p.m. and the weather was overcast. The woods can become very dark in this area, though I was familiar with the general location. As I conducted my search for the missing hiker, I encountered an unknown entity that was staring at me. It was several hundred feet away, but I could make out that it was human shape, but very large and tall. I cautiously approached the individual. As I got closer, it was obvious that this man was nude and that he was of tremendous size. I was within 50 yards or so when he bolted to my right into the deep dark woods at a speed that was completely impossible for a human being to achieve. I yelled for him, or it, to stop, but he continued to run away. My instincts told me that this giant may somehow be involved in the disappearance of the hiker. By this time, I had drawn my weapon. I was hesitant to call for help or to report what I had witnessed. I was even questioning myself as to what this could have been. Was I hallucinating this giant being? I tried to follow the giant man, but it was simply impossible to do so. After 15 minutes or so, I was getting spooked and decided to find my way back to the trail and continue with a search for the hiker. I'll admit, I was fearful of being ambushed by the giant man. The giant man was at least 12 feet in height, very muscular in build, olive skin with no visible hair. He was completely nude. I didn't get close enough to describe facial features, but the head was enormous and oval-shaped. He never made any sounds. It just seems impossible that anything of that size really exists. The hiker was eventually found nearer to Mitt, Rainier, which was east of my location. I remained with the department for another three years until I moved to Oregon and started working for a security firm. After my encounter with the giant, I was much more wary of the outdoors. I still questioned what I witnessed that day, but I never told anyone other than my wife and a close friend about the incident. I'm not sure if they believe me. I have never heard of any related sightings here in the Pacific Northwest. This is why I contacted you. Have you ever heard or read of a similar sighting or encounter? Do the giants really exist? Thanks for your time. I grew up in western New York, near Rochester, not too far from the Canadian border. My dad built a mini mansion that backed up to the forever wild woods. That's the New York State program that keeps the wilderness as is. Once the house was built, the woods became the playhouse for myself and my closest friend DJ. It is the early 1990s and we love being outside. One day, while exploring, we found an amazing section about 50 minutes' walk into the woods that was a gorgeous swamp full of flowers and light. I remember approaching it. There were snapped trees all around and straight branches jammed into the ground like spikes. The solid land went into the swamp like a peninsula. 
The trees were almost like walls on each side that funneled us out onto it. We approached the water and saw snapping turtles quickly submerged. Being kids, we started skipping rocks and throwing boulders to get splashes, just doing what kids do. Then out of nowhere, DJ and I felt a wave of fear, sort of a sixth sense. Our hair stood up. We were both looking around for what triggered this primal feeling. DJ pointed to a tree across the water, and I can only describe it as if the top half was bending back and forth, not like the wind was gently pushing it, but like it was close to snapping, left, then right, back and forth. It was bending, creaking loud, over and over, quicker and quicker. The bottom of the tree barely moved. Then out of nowhere, there was this rumbling growl that was so loud it shook our insides. I've been around loud things before and even learned to shoot an 8-gauge black powder shotgun. No sound compared to the force of this. Picture your soul getting pushed out your back and then springing back inside like a giant invisible rubber band. In the pierced silence of this, we both ran for our effing lives. The whole way home, we ran through bushes and branches, ripping up our exposed skin. We both thought we could hear pursuit all around us, but said nothing. Once home, we tried sharing what happened with my parents, but they wouldn't listen. We decided to stay inside for the rest of the day. As usual, DJ was spending the night, and we decided to crash in the support, a 25 by 25 foot room filled with double hung windows on two exterior walls. A sliding glass door that led to a three-story deck, and a, a French door that led to a formal living room. Dad had worked hard. He went from a garbage man to a business owner, so this house was massive. Anyway, DJ was on the couch while I lay on the floor in front of the TV with a Nintendo. It was summer, so all the double-hung windows were opened wide. I stretched out with my arms behind my head my neck on a couple of pillows, and my fingers were interlaced. My hands were sort of folding up the back of my head with elbows flared out. DJ was out and snoring, and I was half asleep watching something on the TV. As God is my is my witness. Out of nowhere, I felt a massive hand engulf both my hands and part of my wrist, and pull me toward the windows. I moved a good two, three feet, and effing lost it, screaming in terror. It released me, and within a minute, my dad ran in. DJ was silent and just staring at me. I told my dad what happened, so he went to each window and said the screens were all slid down and in place. He said that it was just a dream for me to man up and shut up. I shut up and prayed he'd just go back out. I looked at DJ and asked him if he had seen it. He just looked at me and didn't say anything about it. He ended up calling his parents and getting picked up in the middle of the night. I went upstairs and tried to sleep in my room. The next day I called DJ's house to see if he wanted to come over, and his mom said he didn't feel good and to not call again until I heard from him. This confused my 12-year-old mind. We never got together again after that. I'd see him occasionally. He was cold with me every time. Eventually, at the end of summer, I ran into him on the canal path, one of our fishing spots, and decided to question him. His mom wasn't there to be the buffer. He finally confessed that on that night, for some reason, he awoke and saw a predator grab and pull me. He didn't use that specific word. Instead, he described a massive, clear but distorted shimmer thing that reached in and grabbed me. I never knew others had seen this cloak of invisibility. I now refer to it as a predator. Did it lift the screen up slide easily enough and then close it that quick? Did it somehow pass through the fiberglass mesh? I just don't know. I looked in the morning but saw no tracks and DJ thought it was a ghost. I didn't put it all together until much later as an adult. I think it followed me home after we trespassed on its turf. It could have hurt us easily at any time, but it didn't. I almost think it had a sick type of humor and enjoyed terrifying us a little bit. I never went that far back in the woods after that. In September 2020, I had a chilling encounter that still haunts my memory to this day.
I was on my way to work, driving along United State 10 near Reed City, Michigan. It was a typical morning, and I was lost in thought, sipping my coffee and listening to the radio. Little did I know that this ordinary commute would lead to a brush with the extraordinary. As I cruised down the highway, something caught my eye in the rearview mirror. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light, but when I glanced back again, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A massive, seven-foot-tall creature, weighing at least 375 pounds, sprinted across the road behind me. It moved with an uncanny speed and agility for its size. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to catch another glimpse of the creature. It was covered in dark, matted fur, and its form was unlike anything I had ever seen. This was no bear or any known animal that should be roaming the woods of Michigan. I watched in disbelief as it vanished into the dense forest on the other side of the road. I was left in a state of shock, my mind racing to comprehend what I had just witnessed. I had always been a skeptical person when it came to tales of cryptids and creatures of the unknown, but this encounter had shaken me to my core. I never saw it, but in 1975 I was newly married, about 21 years old, and had a small baby. My sister, who was a teenager, was visiting us. My husband, my sister, and I had all gone to our bedrooms to settle down and go to sleep. I would say it was around 11 or 12 at night. We were just starting to relax and get sleepy, when out of nowhere there was this horrible loud howl or yell. I mean, it was so loud it made my chest vibrate and my ears hurt. The sound was not human, but had a guttural human-like sound, mixed with what sounded like a wolf. We were living in a mobile home at the time, and it howled just outside our back door, in the hallway near our bedroom. We jumped out of bed, looked at each other, and both said at the same time, What the hell was that? My husband was ten years older than I was and was an avid hunter. He wasn't the kind of guy to scare easily. His face drained of color. My sister came running down the hallway, white as a ghost, and said, What was that? I told her I didn't know. My husband said he was getting his rifle and grabbed it out of the closet. He opened up the back door and yelled out into the wind, You better get the S out of here, or I will blow your head off. He listened a moment before I yelled at him to please shut the door. He did, and we never heard any more after that. Needless to say, we stayed up all night afraid to go to sleep. I have never forgotten that howl. There is no way it was a dog or coyotes. I have heard both howl. It wasn't a guy joking around either. It was so loud, there is no way a human could have made that sound. I love your show, and I'm glad to hear I am not the only one who has heard something like this. I'm in summer camp and something is throwing people off trees. A little introduction before we begin. My friends and I have been going to summer camp every year. Tom, Jack, Susan, and Emily are my friends who have been accompanying me since forever. We're high school students. This time we chose a different camp. It was called Camp Jacob, and it's on a small island called Jacob's Isle. We traveled to Jacob's Isle on a ferry. It is about three and a half hour journey from the mainland, and the first thing we noticed was that there is no cell reception here. David is the leader of the summer camp, and he has a satellite phone for communication with the ferry and mainland. We hiked till the camp. It was a half hour hike. We saw the establishment was amazing. There were two dozen small huts made of wood. The main building was no different. The main building was in the middle of the camp, and it comprised of a common room, kitchen, dining room, a storage room, and an infirmary. Twelve huts, each on either side of the main building. Each hut had two bunk beds and can fit four people. Tom, Jack, and I got in hut seven, along with fellow camper Ashwin. Emily and Susan went to hut 20. One, all four corner huts. One, twelve, thirteen, twenty-four were occupied by them. We were to unpack and meet the others in 30 minutes where we shall make a bonfire for the evening. 
It was a fun experience. We have made friends with Ashwin, and we also met the girls sharing the hut with Susan and Emily. They were Lily and Rose. Lily and Rose were cousins. We had dinner and were told that we would go to the sunrise point in the morning, and so we have to wake up by 4.30 a.m., as the sunrise is at 5.45 a.m. It is a half-hour hike, and it wasn't easy to get up so early. We started the hike at 5 a.m. and were told it was about 10 minutes away, but in reality it took twice the time. We were on the east coast of the island. It was a beach of white sand. This was my new favorite place. Jack had his camera out to capture the moment when the sun rises. It was a beautiful sight and worth waking up early. We hiked back to the camp through the forest when we heard a growling sound. It was scary. The counselors huddled us and escorted us back to the camp. I could see that they were nervous. We were told to go to the main building for breakfast. I saw David and three others went scouting north of the camp. The other counselors were smiling, but they were tense. What do you think that scent was? I asked. It was scary. I don't care what it was, and I don't want to know, Susan replied. Only that it should stay away from us, Emily said. Come on, Peter. Don't scare the girls, Tom laughed. Yeah, it can be a bird or something. The forest can make it sound scarier, Ashwin said with conviction. I disagree. Something scary is out there. Check this out. Jack gestured us to take a look at his camera. The small lead screen wasn't so easy to look at, but Emily saw what Jack wanted to show. It took a lot of pointing and zooming before I could see the red dots behind the trees. Jack thought they were eyes. I thought they were lens flares or something. This is not a scary movie, all right. It must be some lens flare thingy, I said, but deep down I was scared too. Susan queried, Guys, where is Lily and Rose? Must be somewhere here, Ashwin said. I haven't seen them after we came back to camp, Tom responded in a worried manner. Come, Susan, let's check the hut out. Emily grabbed on Susan's hand and they went to find Lily and Rose. No sooner did they leave the common room did we hear the same growling sound followed by loud shrieks. We ran outside to see Emily fainted and Susan holding her. Then I saw the lifeless body of Rose. Blood splattered everywhere, as if she has jumped from a tall building. Another bone-chilling growl, and then I froze. I saw Lily flying. Something had thrown her from a tree, and she came crashing down just beside Rose. I couldn't scream. This was something which I'd never expected to witness. This couldn't be a dream, as I don't have the imagination to imagine something as gruesome as this. The counselors came running out and asked us to check if anyone else is missing. It was a huge mess. Everyone was shouting. It took some time for us to settle down. We were scared to death. The bodies were moved to the infirmary in the main building. Everyone else was accounted for. David and the three others who left with him returned, and they called the mainland for the ferry. The camp was obviously canceled. The growling continued. We were told to pack up our stuff, and we would leave after three hours. It wasn't easy to wait for three long hours. We have to hike south to go to the dock. They should send the army to kill this thing, Emily said, still shaking. The growling continued. Maybe this thing has given birth or something and felt threatened when we came here, Susan said. Stop trying to justify murder, I shouted. I know she was just trying to help, trying to make sense of it all, but I was scared shitless. I am sorry. I am just scared. I apologize. Susan put her hand on mine. It's okay. I understand. We were all called outside and David announced, given the circumstances. We will not hike to the dock. We will wait here for help to arrive. The sheriff's department along with the forest rangers will be arriving soon and they will escort us out of here. Till then stay quiet. Please, don't wander off anywhere. If you have to go back to the hut, then inform a counselor. Don't go out alone. This was good news. After a few tense hours, we were escorted out to the ferry and returned home. On the way back, we were told it was a bear, which must have done it. But it was a bizarre scenario. 
No one has ever heard anything like this before. I don't buy it one bit. Something is definitely wrong in that island. I have promised myself no more summer camps. But I still have nightmares and I feel that I am back at the camp. It is nighttime and something is throwing me down from the top of a tree. I'll never forget that fateful day in Illinois six years ago, the day I stood at the grave of my beloved wife, Lulu. Her passing had been sudden, a cruel twist of fate that had ripped her from my life. It was a pain I thought I would never recover from, and I was there at the funeral watching in disbelief as the casket was lowered into the cold earth. The sound of dirt hitting the coffin lid haunted me for years, Life had other plans for me, and I soon found myself in Kansas, trying to leave behind the memories of Lulu. I had been living there for three years, merely going through the motions of existence. There was nothing extraordinary about this part of my story. Such things happen every day. But then came the strange part, the inexplicable events that have left me puzzled and restless. It all started when I received a letter from my old home in Illinois, postmarked and signed with Lulu's name, unmistakably in her handwriting. I was certain of it because I compared it with letters she had written me before our marriage, letters I had kept as precious mementos. In that letter, Lulu claimed to be lonely and missing me terribly, urging me to return to her. But it contained a sentence that sent shivers down my spine. You all thought I died, but I did not, and am much better than when I saw you last. I couldn't fathom what that meant. How could someone who had been buried come back to life? Initially, I believed it to be a sick joke, perhaps the work of some friends back in Illinois. However, as more letters arrived, my unease grew. These letters, filled with affection and longing, provided no answers, only more questions. One particularly unnerving letter reached me from Concordia, Kansas, near where I used to live before coming to Nebraska. The writer lamented the fact that I had left before she could reach me, and the handwriting remained identical to Lulu's. This couldn't be a prank. It was something more sinister and inexplicable. My anxiety grew, and I sent some of the letters back to Lulu's parents, who confirmed the handwriting as their daughters but were as mystified as I was frustration gnawed at me, pushing me to address one of the letters to Mrs. W.W.S. Amoson. That letter, too, came back, returned from the dead. Letter office. The last letter, received about three weeks ago, was dated from Table Rock, Nebraska, and stated that Lulu was there, sick and in dire need of help. I rushed to Table Rock, determined to get to the bottom of this bizarre mystery. Upon my arrival, I learned that a woman matching Lulu's description had been staying at a local hotel. She was sick, rarely leaving her room, and departed suddenly without revealing her destination. The hotel register had an entry under the name Mrs. Lulu Amoson, with no address provided. It was the same handwriting, and the woman's description closely matched that of my dear Lulu from the last time I had seen her. Frustration and confusion gave way to a resolute determination. I decided to return to Illinois and had Lulu's remains exhumed, only to find her, as she had been buried years ago. There was no mistaking that fact. Now I stand at the crossroads of this inexplicable enigma, and my curiosity and apprehension gnaw at me. Who had been sending those letters, and who was the woman who had been using Lulu's name? I am not a superstitious man, but this bewildering mystery has shaken me to my core. My reputation remains untarnished, and my employer vouches for my character. Should I receive any more letters, I am resolved not to let them torment me, but to uncover the truth behind this eerie riddle. And when I do, I have promised to share my findings with the world. I'm writing today because I just read the story from a lady who is claiming the Mothman lived in her backyard. I don't completely disbelieve her claims as I'm in no position to do so. That's up to you and your investigators. 
I do know we have lots of underground creatures and many unexplained things in the woods. I wanted to tell you about an experience I had when I still lived back home in Wayne, West Virginia. It was around 2003. It was fall, I think. Being that I grew up in the W.O.B. Mountains, I've always been aware of the stories of the Mothman, creatures similar to the Mothman and what my great-grandmother called panthers. I don't know what these panthers really were, but she had a ton of stories about her father having to outsmart them and keep them away while traveling through the woods to get to town. I know she wasn't describing a mountain lion or bobcat. We all know what those are, and as far as I know... Those hills aren't roaming grounds for mountain lions. They always said these creatures were vicious. They'd snatch who and whatever they could. However, they were afraid of fire. So it's fall. My ex-husband and I had been at my aunt's house for a birthday party. She lives on a country road with the mountains behind the house. For miles, there's nothing but woods back there. We were the first to leave. It was around dusk, and I was following my ex-husband out to the car while carrying my two-year-old son. Right before we reached the car, we were stopped dead in our tracks by the creepiest sound I have ever heard. It was so loud, echoing off the hills. It sounded very similar to a woman screaming bloody murder, just like the stories my great-grandmother told, but was definitely not a woman. It was one of those sounds that just feels ominous and sends those cold chills down your spine. I looked at my ex-husband and could tell it frightened him. That's what scared me more than anything. He was an avid woodsman and hunter. He knew the woods, could happily live in a tent in the woods, and wasn't afraid of much in life in general. I started searching the tree line with my eyes, just trying to see if I could see it. I could feel it staring right down at us. Yet we were both kind of frozen in shock. Then he gave me a look and told me to get my son and my, myself in the car immediately. I did, but thought we probably should have told everyone in the house to be careful when they went to leave. That was the only time in the 25 years I lived in. Yeah, that I heard that sound. Though, I continued to hear stories over the years. I don't know what that thing really is, and I don't want to find out personally. I also had a neighbor in 2006 that told me some pretty scary stuff. She said she was living in a house on Buffalo Creek Road in Wayne County, W.O.V.W. This is a back road, woods and mountains on both sides. My family owned quite a bit of land out there. There were mounds up on the mountains where the Native Americans buried their dead. She said there was an old cabin a little ways behind and to the right of the house. She was there alone. It was dark and getting late, so she decided to go to bed. She said as soon as she turned the lights off, she started hearing lots of racket coming from the cabin. Like pots and pans clanging together, glass breaking, etc., she thought it was a group of rowdy teens messing around in there, so she went out on the porch and yelled to tell them to hit the road. The noise stopped, but she didn't see any kids. She went back in to grab a flashlight and went closer to the cabin to investigate. She could see something dark move past the windows. She shined the light in, and it apparently looked right out the window at her. She booked it back to the house and locked herself in. She described it as Mothman-like but she didn't think for sure that's what it was. She said it was pure evil. You could feel it. She said it was taller than her, all dark in color. Red eyes walked upright. I believed her. She wasn't one to make things up, and she was clearly frightened to tell the story. To make matters worse, that wasn't the last encounter that she had with the creature. There was another night when she was babysitting her nieces and nephews. She said it came up on the porch and started pacing back and forth. You could hear the boards creak with every step. They locked everything up and all ran into her bedroom and locked themselves in. They all were huddled together on the bed when it came around to the window. I guess it rapped on the window and scratched at it. They literally all hid under the covers. I guess they were all screaming and freaking out. She said it eventually went back to the front porch and was there until close to dawn. 
It wasn't long after that they moved. Now, I will say that I loved being in those woods on Buffalo Creek during the day. We always had fun. We'd find arrowheads and all kinds of different treasures the Indians left behind. At night, however, we wanted to be inside. I hated the back room, closest to the woods. My great-grandfather built several houses on that road. My family still lives there. It just always felt like there was something out there at night. The natural noises would get quiet all of a sudden. It just always seemed scary at night. Even as an adult, I would run from the car to the house. I don't know what's out there, but I'd say there are too many stories and witnesses to discount it. The strange incident took place near Powelton, West Virginia, in December 1934. I was eight years old. At the time, my father worked for Elkhorn, Piney Coal, and McDunn. He and the other miners would take a train to the mine each day. The day before Christmas Eve, my father mentioned an unusual sighting he and the others on the train had while traveling back to Powelton from the mine that evening. As they looked out towards the east, they noticed a very large bird flying above the trees. My father was a very simple man and didn't believe in any nonsense, but this large bird really caught his attention. He described it as a freakish-sized owl, very dark in color. The sky was getting dark, but they could still make out the large form. He said it also looked at the train as it flew over the trees. Nobody on the train could figure out what it was. The mere fact that my father even mentioned it suggested that it must have been an unusual sight. My father was scheduled off from work for three days during the Christmas holiday. On December 27th, he was getting ready for work, but said he felt poorly. My mother was concerned because he had a high fever and awful chills. She insisted he stay home and telephone the doctor. My father was reluctant to stay home and put up a good argument, but my mother was not going to back down. She put him to bed and waited for the doctor. Well, we waited for hours until the telephone rang. The operator told my mother that the doctor was at McDunn. There had been a horrible train explosion. She couldn't talk, but said that the doctor's wife asked her to contact us. My mother was pale when she told my father what had happened. I remember they both started praying and crying. For years, both of them thought the large bird was an angel sent by God as a warning, and that my father's life was saved for a reason. My father never went back to the mine. It turned out that he had contracted polio, though he was very lucky since he survived it with only a slight limp. We soon moved away to a small town in Kentucky where my father found the calling and became a Pentecostal preacher. He told his story of survival to anyone who would listen until the day he died. I happened to read your stories while looking on the internet with my great-grandson. I always assumed my father saw something more divine. That's what he always believed. I'm not so sure now. Back in July of this year, I ordered eight towels from Amazon, and I remember receiving the box. And I have a vivid memory of rolling each towel up and putting them away. And I also remember this was a few days before we went on vacation because I remember being excited that our house or dog sitter would have fresh towels. I return a week later from vacation and can't find the towels anywhere. I thought maybe our sitter took them for some odd reason, but never asked thinking it would come off rude and or weird. I looked everywhere and no towels. How do you misplace eight towels? So as time went on, I forgot about it. But then four months later, I get a notification from Amazon saying I'm getting a refund and it's for the towels. I clicked on it, thinking this is crazy and low, and behold, I got a refund for eight towels because the box was returned to them, and for some reason, the box was unable to be delivered. I don't know what happened, glitch in the matrix, but I am 100% sure. I got those two L's, and then they disappeared. T.S. I always check my Amazon order page, and there was never any issues about the towels not being delivered.
Okay, so one night my husband came into our bedroom where I was already sleeping. When he opened the door, our room was dark, but he was able to see an even darker mist floating either right next to me or over me. He said it rushed by him, out the door, and dissipated. That's happened three times now. We have a lot of paranormal activity wherever we live. It doesn't really matter where. Nothing right now feels negative in any way. Mostly just bored, I think. Anyway, has anyone had any experience with a black mist hovering around them while they sleep or could just know what it is? I would like to add that I've been calling my spirit guides. Odd it been when this was happening so it could be that. I don't have a clue and would greatly appreciate any insight. Thanks in advance. When I was young, my father used to like throwing parties almost every weekend and not just get together. I'm talking hiring a band and inviting friends and family and have them invite friends and family. So I would often see new faces come and go. But there was this one particular time when I was 11 and a girl around 8 years old and her older sister, who was also around 11, came in our house. I was an introverted kid and still am so while everyone was outside socializing. I was inside watching Spongebob like a true scholar would. Well, for some reason these sisters also didn't want to be outside and came inside and that's when I saw that the little sister didn't have any arms from the elbow down. So the little sister sat on one of the kitchen seats. Our kitchen and living room are connected so it's like one giant room. And the older sister was humoring our Chihuahua we had at the time. And Will Me, being the little introvert that I was their presence, killed my vibe. I got up to go to the kitchen and get a snack so I can head to my room. I get my snack and I make my way to my room and before I pass the little sister on the kitchen seat I see her move her stump towards the plate placemat we had at the time and she motion her stump upwards and placemat goes right into the air and she looks under the placemat. I stop dead in my tracks and just stare at her with awe and confusion cause my 11 year old brain cannot comprehend what the hell is happening before my eyes. Doing this caught the attention of her older sister cause she stopped playing with my dog, looked at her sister and rushed towards her, telling her to put it down and that she knows she shouldn't be doing this around people. She then looks at me and we just make eye contact for a solid three seconds. And that's when my cousin opens the front door and tells me the him, my other cousin, and my brother are going across the street to this knick-knack store to buy something and wanted to see if I wanted to tag along, which I did not hesitate in accepting. I told everyone what I just saw, but no one believed me. When we returned, more people had gotten inside and they were now surrounded by other girls. But I kept an eye on that sister the whole party to see if she would do it again. But nothing ever happened after that. So I wanted to ask if someone else has had a similar experience to this. So my mom is the property manager of a local trailer park. The maintenance man and his assistant were doing a scope of the park at around 1.30 a.m. when they saw a strange thing on the roof of the trailer. Originally, they thought it was a mountain lion until it stood on two legs. The creature was paper white, his arms hung below his knees, and it was able to jump from trailer top to trailer top. But the weirdest thing it was doing was calling the name of the tenants inside of the trailers. They continued following it until it jumped over a tall fence and was off in the night. My mom would have thought they were just messing with her if it wasn't for the fact that four tenants called my mom the next morning to report something jumping on their roof. I've considered it being the rake or a flesh pedestrian, but there are problems with it being either one of those. Please help. It was about three years ago in November 2012 when I was working at a small gas station in northeast Louisiana. We were the only small shop and 24-hour service station near Bastrop just off the highway. I worked the night shift. I loved it. The sharing of stories with the traveling customers 
That is when the rare customer showed up. It must have been around 2 a.m. I was cleaning the floors and locking the beer coolers when suddenly the lights went out. I pulled out my cell and used it as a guiding light until I made it back to our counter where I kicked on the gas generator. It lit the parking lot, the bath, and the hall leading to the register. When I looked outside, I could just make out the movement of the trees across the street, but otherwise, it was pitch black. I turned on the radio and started listening to a local station with its night owl DJ commenting on the heavy winds and cracking jokes between songs. Suddenly, I saw some figures in the dark. I could just make them out. They seemed to be a group of kids on bikes. There were three of them. Two of them dropped their bikes and made their way to the door, where they just stood there staring at me. I just stared back for a moment, waiting for them to come in. They never did. I moved around the counter and opened the door. What's up, guys? Out kinda late, aren't you? I asked them, expecting them to come in. Can we use your phone? One asked, their heads tilted kinda low. I felt a little worried as I pulled my cell from my pocket and offered it to her. Sure. She looked at me and then I saw her eyes. They were solid black, almost like ink, filled orbs. No, I need the real one, she said, her face twisted into an angry snarl. I pulled the door closed and flipped the locks. No, no ma'am, you go home and get your mom's phone. They stared at me through the door for a minute longer before turning away and biking off. The next day, I had my boss check the cameras to get the pictures of the creepy kids. But the cameras had been off the whole time. Now the cameras run off the generator instead of the hall lights. I never saw the kids again. For the past few months, I've been noticing these white things in my security camera footage. They are in the trees and make the trees shake like it's a tornado beneath and make the trees sway back and forth. At first I thought it was the police watching me, but then I keep seeing so many of them in one place. There is no way it's that many cops. They are white and have like a black slit for eyes and a round black nose. They are very sneaky. Once one was hiding behind something outside and kept peeking around. Looking at my cameras like it knew I was watching, I have numerous videos and footage of all this. I tried posting to YouTube, but everyone thinks I'm crazy. It's really starting to bother me because I don't know WTH is going on with these things back when I thought they were cops, I called them Piggy Wiggies. So let's call them that these Piggy Wiggies move in the trees in like a jerking motions and climb up and down tree very fast. I have footage of these piggy wiggies, if you don't believe me. I'm into classical antiquity and thought maybe I had summoned some demons or something when I was trying to speak Latin to these telemarketer that wouldn't quit calling me every day all day, so I said some crazy stuff in Latin hoping it would spook them off like Mercury knows what you did to Babak. is coming for you. There will be no mercy, so that's another thing I thought. I know what you're thinking, but I'm not crazy. Okay. Anyways, please help if you have any idea what they piggies wiggies are. Thank you. I'm staying in Pigeon Forge near the Smoky Mountains right now and in a cabin in the woods. There's other cabins nearby, though. I was dead asleep last night and my boyfriend was still outside in the hot tub and he came inside yelling for me and woke me up. He said that he started hearing something big moving around in the forest and he thought it was a bear. But he shined his flashlight and it was like something small moving through the grasses that he couldn't see. There were multiple of them but they were covered by the grass and moving in different directions. He only saw one but it was a little ways in the distance and he described it as long and tan and skin colored like a person that was on their belly slithering around but moving really fast and graceful. Then clear as day he heard a woman's voice scream, help me, someone? And he says it was the weirdest sound, like it didn't sound like a real person. 
It sounded rehearsed and fake, and he couldn't tell where it was coming from. Anyone know what this is? We're freaked. I've seen what I believe was either an alien in disguise, a hologram beamed down by aliens, or some other sort of trickery they were using to lure me towards them so they could abduct me and my friends. Here is my story. It was 2001. I was driving my car on the Blue Ridge Parkway near Asheville, North Carolina. My three friends and I spent the day at a nice place called Graveyard Field. I was driving us home, sober by way, late at night. We were chatting normally when all of a sudden I see a two to three foot tall, all white squirrel standing up right at the edge of the road. My headlamps illuminated it as I drove by and it turned its head to make eye contact and follow my eyes. I instantly had the thought, that is not of this world. I turned to my friends to say, did you just see that? All three of them were instantly asleep with their heads tilted to the side and resting on their shoulders. I was flabbergasted. We were just talking seconds ago and now all are asleep. About 20 seconds later I saw a second identical one. Same exact thing happened except I knew my friends were already asleep. My mind was racing. I looked at the clock. I don't think we lost any time. Then the girl in the front seat started waking up, and I excitedly told her the story. Then we saw a third one, identical to the first two. She was equally freaked out by it. I don't think they got us. That's the end of the story. However, a couple years later, I flipped through the pages of a book about UFOs. I think it was Communion by Wiley Straber. I randomly opened a book to a chapter with a drawing of an all-white deer with big black almond-shaped eyes. In the book, he interviews lots of abductees. There's a category of abductees who claim they were in the woods when they saw an all-white animal with big black almond-shaped eyes. When they walked towards it to investigate, they were abducted. This is a true story. Has anyone else ever heard of this phenomenon? The biting arctic wind cut through the layers of my gear as our helicopter descended onto the desolate, ice-covered landscape. The frigid air stung my face, a stark contrast to the warmth of the briefing room where Commander Anderson had informed us of our mission. A group of Navy SEALs led by me, Anthony, and an occasional camper were sent to investigate the mysterious disappearance of scientists at a United States research facility in the Arctic. As we touched down on the snowy ground, the bleak expanse of the Arctic greeted us. The research facility loomed in the distance, a solitary outpost against the icy backdrop. Our team disembarked, each member adjusting their gear, prepared for the unknown that awaited us. Approaching the facility, an eerie silence hung in the air. The only sound was the crunching of our boots on the frozen ground. The metallic scent of blood reached my nostrils and my heart quickened. We cautiously entered the facility, finding it eerily silent and devoid of life. Signs of struggle were evident with overturned furniture and shattered glass. A weak moan drew our attention to a corner of the room. There we found a man, battered and bruised, close to death. His raspy breaths barely formed words as he croaked out a chilling tale. The scientists had been attacked by creatures in the snow. Enormous beings resembling a snowy version of Bigfoot. Before we could glean more information, the man succumbed to his injuries. Determined to uncover the truth, we ventured into the nearby woods, where the tracks of the mysterious creatures led. The towering pines loomed overhead, their branches weighed down by the heavy snow. Following the massive footprints, our breath visible in the cold air, we felt a sense of unease creeping over us. The tracks led us deeper into the forest, but at some point they disappeared, swallowed by the relentless snow. We retraced our steps, frustration mounting, and returned to the abandoned facility. The atmosphere grew tense as the shadows of the forest seemed to close in around us. Suddenly the tranquility shattered as a menacing growl echoed through the trees. 
massive shadowy figures emerged, the creatures we had only heard about until now. Their fur blended seamlessly with the snow, and their glowing predatory eyes locked on to us. Panic set in as the creatures lunged forward, teeth bared. A fierce battle erupted between our SEAL team and the formidable creatures. Gunfire rang out in the icy air, mixing with the ferocious roars of the creatures. Chaos ensued as we fought tooth and nail to survive, using every ounce of training to combat the relentless onslaught. After what felt like an eternity, we managed to regroup and retreat, calling for backup as we fled the treacherous woods. The creatures pursued us their howls echoing in the arctic night. Backup arrived just in time, and together we repelled the creatures, forcing them back into the shadows. As we caught our breath, I relayed the harrowing encounter to Commander Anderson. Skepticism furrowed his brow, dismissing our account as a result of stress and fatigue. However, the haunted eyes of my team spoke volumes. We had faced something inexplicable in the arctic wilderness, a chilling menace that defied explanation. In the summer of 1984, I went tent camping near Mount Hood for a week. I can't be entirely sure, but I believe it was around Zigzag, Oregon. After several days of camping, I was feeling quite grubby, so I decided to head to a shallow creek to take a bath in a small pool. The sun had already set, and the last traces of light were fading around 8.30 in the evening. That's when I had the distinct feeling that something or someone was watching me. Startled, I glanced up and saw a silhouette in the twilight. It was crouched down by the creek with its hands in the water, as if it were washing them. As I made eye contact with this mysterious figure, I was initially gripped by fear, thinking it might be a bear. My glasses were off at the time, which added to my uncertainty. But then something strange happened. It was as though I heard a voice in my head, almost as if someone was speaking to me, saying, I'm not gonna hurt you, and you're not gonna hurt me. This unexpected reassurance flooded my thoughts. I quickly reached for my nearby glasses to get a better look. However, when I turned back, the figure had vanished into the bushes. I recall the creature as being dark brown, covered in four half-inch hair all over its body. I didn't see anything in its hands. It appeared to be in the midst of what I could only describe as cleaning itself, washing its hands. When asked about the message I received, all I can say is that the answer seemed to form in my mind. A message of peace and understanding. It was as if we both agreed silently that we should part ways and continue on our separate journeys. It happened on a stretch of Highway 6, situated between I-5 and the rugged coastal region. The day was slowly transitioning into evening as my companion and I were driving along the desolate road. The dense foliage seemed to press in on both sides, encroaching upon the highway's edges. We were several hundred yards away when it first caught our attention. An imposing figure suddenly emerged from the wilderness and boldly crossed the road. It moved swiftly and with a purposeful gait, as if it had a destination in mind. My heart began to race as I struggled to make sense of what I was witnessing. As we drew nearer to the point where the figure had crossed, I was struck by a strange realization. The foliage at the roadside was dense and impenetrable, as if no one could have passed through. The figure, which had appeared so large and imposing, had vanished into the thick underbrush. I knew in my gut that this was no ordinary encounter. It wasn't a hiker or a hunter, as there was an unmistakable air of mystery about the figure's appearance. It moved with an intention, as if it was aware of our presence and was deliberately crossing our path. I strained my eyes to catch every detail, but all I could discern was a tall, towering form, exceeding six feet in height, and it was unclothed, devoid of any distinguishable attire. The entire encounter was over in seconds, leaving us in stunned silence driving along the highway with a sense of wonder and disbelief. 
this enigmatic encounter with the towering, unclothed figure would remain etched in my memory, a moment of sheer perplexity and intrigue. It left me with more questions than answers, wondering about the mysteries that dwell within the depths of the wilderness and the secrets that remain hidden along the highway. I was 11. I was staying up all night playing video games when I heard something outside in the bushes. I was paranoid and the blinds were wide open, so I looked outside and saw reddish, orange eyes. I could also barely make out a face with a snout. I fell back in fear and heard a howl outside and then footsteps getting further away. When I got back up, two minutes later, it was gone. During my school summer break in 2017, I spent my days lazily lounging at home and watching TV. Bored one day, I decided to go outside to see if I could do anything with my chickens, like feeding them worms and snails. Before I go into more detail, let me explain the area where I live. My home is on the outskirts of the city I reside in. At that time, I had about five to seven chickens, and we hadn't expanded the co-op yet, so it was a small pen connecting to two sides of the chicken cup, which was wooden and sturdy. The only ways to get into the co-op were through the trap door attached to the big door and the three windows. One window was on one side of the door, and the second window was on the other side. The third window was a large one, and all of them had traps connected to them so they could be closed. We had seven acres of woodland that we called the back haster, and it was a popular habitat for local deer. At that time, there was also a wild boar roaming around, though I wasn't sure how it had gotten there. We had been having troubles with poachers, given the high deer population in the woods. One poacher had even set up a motion, activated trail camera. An old rusty deer stand had been put on a tree a long time ago, and the tree had grown around it. Beyond our acres of woods, there was a large cornfield owned by our neighbors, and beyond that, there was a forest. I didn't know what the forest was like beyond that field because we'd never been there. So one day, I went outside to do something with my chickens and brought along a bucket of corn for feeding the deer afterward. When I walked out of my house, I saw a doe sitting in the tall grass. At first, I thought it was sleeping, as its head was down and it wasn't moving. Being the curious person that I was, I decided to sneak up on the deer to get a picture of it to show my mother when she got home from work. I crept as silently as I could across the yard, which separated me from the deer. I should also mention that we had a clearing with a burn pit filled with cedar branches. When I had cleared the burn pit and was about ten yards from it, I realized that the deer wasn't asleep. It was dead. It was the most disgusting sight I had ever seen, with its intestines completely gone, the flesh shredded and blood everywhere. It seemed like it had been sitting there for a while, and the stench was unbearable. Strangely, there were no insects around it, making the forest seem unnaturally lifeless. As I left the bucket at the beginning of the trail, intending to come back later with my mother to examine the deer, I started to walk back to my house. After taking a few steps, I heard a low, snarling growl that sounded like a wolf, though it seemed distorted like an old radio. Against my better judgment, I turned my head around and saw what looked like the biggest wolf I had ever seen. It was on all fours, with black matted fur, a broad face, and a short, snarling muzzle. Its eyes were a dim, deep, amber-red-yellow, and its ears resembled those of a Doberman pincher with a cropped effect. Its front legs were long and muscular, and its paws looked more like large hands with long claws. The creature stood up, emitting a sickening popping sound, and it was incredibly tall, towering over me. Despite being about ten meters away from it, I realized it was significantly taller than me, a five-foot-four-inch person. It lacked a tail and seemed to tower over me. I was about five foot four inches at the time, nowhere close to its height. It was so tall that the tip of its ears could almost touch the top of a young cedar tree. 
The creature let out a loud howl that was more like a roar, and it charged toward me. Fueled by fear and adrenaline, I began to run, clearing my yard and reaching the safety of my house. I slammed and locked all the doors and windows. As I calmed down a bit, I realized that if the creature had wanted to kill me, it could have. What I experienced was not an attack, but a bluff charge, a common tactic among many predators in the wild. Although this encounter happened almost two years ago, it still terrifies me to think about it. The deer had disappeared the next day, and ever since that evening, I've been wary of those woods, only venturing in during broad daylight and never without a weapon. Unfortunately, I cannot say that I'm one of those people who have stopped experiencing things after the encounter. Although I had only nightmares for a month after that day in June, nothing really started to happen again until about two months ago. During a night when I was staying up playing on my laptop, I started hearing things moving around on the porch. I turned on the light and saw the shape of something huge disappearing behind the corner of my house. There was also one of the rare times I ventured into the woods after the first encounter. I was helping my mother clear brush from the hunting clearing, going to get the mower and walking the trail to do so. But I heard bipedal footsteps following me off to the side. They stopped whenever I stopped, and I eventually ran out of the woods. I haven't been back since. I asked my late grandmother about the creature I had seen, and she informed me that there was something called the Wolfhead Man that stopped the Kanza tribe from preying on small children who strayed too far from their tents. Later, my history teacher informed me that my house had been built on tribal burial ground, which has since made me wonder if that had anything to do with it. I hadn't heard about the Wolfhead Man before my grandmother told me about it, when I saw that there were several eyewitness reports that were proven to be truthful, it made me feel a lot better about coming out with this information. I had attempted to tell people previously, but everyone either said I was stupid, crazy, or just a liar. One thing's for certain, I am not stupid. I am not crazy, and I am most definitely not a liar. I know what I saw, and what I saw was a dog man. I live in El Paso, Texas, and back in 2007, I moved to the lower valley for about seven months and lived in some very decent apartments. I was 16 at the time, and it was before I figured myself out. I would get bullied a lot because I was the new kid, and because of this, I would sneak out at night and walk around my apartments to clear my mind. I would always witness very strange things, like a girl dressed in white flashes of a man hanging from a tree, unexplained shadows and lights, and much more. I wasn't the only one who would witness this. Everyone would, even my own family. But the one thing me and my family will never forget are the owls. A week before I moved from there, my best friend at the time wanted to spend the night and spend as much time together before I moved back to central El Paso, closer to Juarez and the city. Well, he ended up becoming ill and did not want to spend the night, so I walked him home. When I came back, I laid on my couch and stared at my closed curtains. Outside there was a light, so if anyone would pass, we would see the silhouette of the figure. As I laid on my couch, I kept hearing this strange flapping of like wings of a bird. I didn't think much of it, so I put my ears phones and listened to my iPod. I continued to stare at the window simply out of boredom, and then something strange happened. I saw a huge bird fly right by the window and turned into a woman. The woman stood there as if it knew I could see her, and as quickly as it happened, she walked away. I could hear her footsteps disappearing into the empty staircase outside my apartment. For a long time, I kept this to myself, simply because I didn't want anyone to think I was crazy. Three days before I moved out, there was an owl on the tree where my window was, but I did not want to think much about it, so I simply walked in and proceeded with my night walk. The night before I left for El Paso, it happened again only a bit different. I saw the same thing I did before, only this time she didn't stand. 
I saw the owl turn into a dark-skinned woman and then sprint off as if she was running from something or as if she was scared or in danger. I obviously never went outside to see, mainly because I was a little kid and scared out of my mind. So about four months after we moved, my mother called us all into the living room for a talk. The conversations we had made me feel like I had my sanity back. I knew I was not crazy. My mother, my brother, and I had seen the same thing, only at different times and places. My brother saw it from far away outside as he was walking home from a friend's house. He said he saw an owl turn into a woman and ran off into the field. My mother had experienced it many times as she came home from her late night shifts. Many times far away and others only feet away. I want to know if anyone has experienced these things with owls. Does anyone know any type of folk tales and myths and stuff about these creatures I wish to know more? I came across your channel and I was listening to your podcast about the Chicago wing humanoid sightings that you've investigated. I also noticed that there have been sightings reported in the Rockford, Illinois area. I had a strange incident occur a few years ago, and I was wondering if you could give me your thoughts on it. Even though it's not a winged humanoid, it did involve an unexplained creature in a weird darkness. There are a few public hiking trails near my house in northern Illinois in Winnebago County. Rock Cut State Park is very near me as well. I'm an amateur photographer, and there were great opportunities to take nature photos. I was particularly interested in taking photos of songbirds, and I would always see a greater variety on this trail. I don't know how many times I hiked that trail, but it had to have been several dozen. I never once felt anything strange there. But then again, I always stayed on the trail. Once in a while, I would venture maybe ten yards into the woods to get a good photo, but that was it. A smaller trail split off from the main trail deep in the woods. You could tell it was definitely not part of the state park trail, but it had been well traveled. I never saw anybody on it, but I rarely ever saw anybody else out there at all. My experience happened in late July 2021. I had just gotten off work and I wanted to get some photos in the evening light, so I headed out to my secluded trail. The sun sets about 9 p.m. in the summer, so I had plenty of time after work to hike that trail and to be back to the car before dark. My hike seemed normal enough, but when I got to that small trail, I noticed that it was roped off. The Park Service had posted a sign that stated Hidden Falls area, erosion damage, and to keep out. I should have heeded the sign, but I wanted to see the waterfall for myself since it could be a good photo opportunity. So down the trail I went. I didn't notice any erosion damage on the way down, but I had never been on that trail before, so I didn't really have anything to compare it to. The trail led almost straight down, and the foliage became denser. I could hear the waterfall well before I saw it. The forest suddenly opened up, and there it was, the hidden falls. It was almost magical, something straight out of a fairy tale. The evening sunlight pierced through the trees and lit up the falling water. I immediately pulled out my camera and began taking photos. I was only there for about ten minutes when I heard laughing. It didn't sound exactly like a human voice, though there was something off about it. I looked around and I couldn't see anybody else. I called out, but I didn't get a response. I started to pack up my camera. But when I heard the laugh again, and this time it sounded like it was coming from the stream itself, I listened closer and I was certain it was at the stream. I stuffed my camera back into my bag and I wanted to get the hell out of there. But just as I stood up to leave, it had suddenly gotten dark. I don't mean dark like the sun was setting. I mean dark like the middle of the night. I looked at my watch. It was six. 45, and I knew I had about two hours of sunlight left, but it was dark. I could see stars through the gaps in the trees. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right. I had to get myself back to the car as fast as I could. I got on the trail heading out and used my cell phone as a flashlight. As I climbed out, I heard the laughing again, but this time it sounded like it was coming from the trees. So I aimed my light at the trees. 
but I couldn't see anything. Then I caught it. A pair of eyes reflected back at me. They stared at me for a moment, and then the laughing began again. I held the light towards the creature, and it showed itself for just a moment. It ducked from beneath some branches and stood there in the light. It looked like a coyote standing about 30 feet up a tree. It looked at me, tilted its head, and it smiled, but not like a dog smile. I don't quite know how to describe it, but I knew it wasn't a coyote. As soon as it revealed itself, it laughed again, and I ran. I could barely see where I was going, but I didn't care. I knew that I needed to get away. I have never felt such relief after I reached my vehicle. The sky was light again, and it was as if nothing had happened. I have not gone back to the state park. I've never figured out just what that coyote or whatever actually was or what it wanted. I never made any inquiries since I had no plans to ever return. In 2015, my friends and I went to Mexico, Chapa State, for a holiday. We rented out a bungalow with forest and stuff at the back. They went out to get more beer and just some shopping, and I was left behind to have a shower. After yelling that they were going double lock the door, they leave. The shop was about a 15-minute walk away, and I was literally just going to wash my hair, make tea, and watch some TV until they got back. About five minutes went by, and I heard a knock on the front door. It was weird as my friends had keys to this apartment. I just guessed that they were too lazy to use the keys and forgot something. I literally got out of the shower with lather in my hair and was walking towards the door with a towel just wrapped around me. The door had a panel of textured glass in the middle and I could see this massive entity standing there. My friends and I are quite small and the guys have blonde hair. This thing looked big, tawny brown with spots and was very tall. Whatever it was, it was tapping on the door, and I was standing at the entrance to the kitchen, just peeking around the corner. I don't want it to see me, and I slowly crouched down and crawled to the sofa. It's still tapping. After what seemed like ages, it just walks off, and the textured glass returns to normal, with nothing on the other side. My friends came back, and one of the guys quickly opened the door and said, Oh my God! We were walking back, and we turned the road. Where the room is right, and we see this massive thing. It looked like a hyena. That's all I can describe it as, but only it was walking on two legs. At least someone else saw it. I told them about it coming to the door. He's still going on. Yeah, and as we saw it, it started making a weird yelling and growling noise. I swear to you, it walked off on those two legs and into the forest. Do you have any idea what we may have seen? It was around 10 p.m. on January 3, 2017, and I was riding around in my car with my girlfriend. We live in Lee County, Florida. We saw a lot of stars out in our neighborhood, and we thought it was romantic, so I parked my car at the side of the road, opened the roof window, and stargazed. Then all of a sudden, we heard an extremely loud bang that sounded like a gunshot. But it came from the sky. My girlfriend and I were startled. Then we looked up to the sky, and that's when things got weird. We saw a multicolored light of some sort, but it was streaking quickly across the sky. The sound got louder, and the situation didn't look too good, so we tried to drive away. And that's when the impact occurred. The shockwave was intense and made my car. My girlfriend and I bounced, probably a few inches off the ground. I asked my girlfriend if she was okay, and she looked like she'd seen a ghost while staring at something behind me when I was faced in her direction. I turned around and saw a car-sized shiny metallic object smoking and stuck into the ground about three feet deep. We got out of the car to get a closer look, and it seemed the object had individual little plates shifting and attaching to the other plates. I never felt so scared in my life. Then I realized it wasn't a meteor or any type of craft. It looked like technology, but nothing I'd ever seen before. The plate shifted to a kind of star shape, but were still completely visible. 
My girlfriend screamed in fear when we both saw the entire structure melt into what looked like a black liquid. We ran to the car and I tried to start it, but it, it wasn't working. It didn't even make a sound. We looked back at the object and it was growing taller, but we didn't hear any noise from it. We jumped out of the car and ran as far as we could. We looked back only to see the object solidify into a giant mechanical nettle humanoid figure. It turned around and quickly followed us down the road until we found the edge of the forest in our neighborhood. We climbed up a tree and hid there for about seven or eight minutes, praying not to die while I was trying to calm myself and my girlfriend down. I was able to take a photograph while looking down at the humanoid. I've attached it to this email above. The giant metal humanoid stopped looking around, so we both climbed down from the tree. I questioned reality that day. I know that this whole affair seems crazy, but it did happen. I was around 13 and very experienced by then in the woods and as a hunter. My family dropped me off on the opposite portion of the hunting land. We were leasing in South Georgia, United States of America. At over 1,000 acres of timber, they could not even hear me shoot where most people were hunting. I was dropped off in the darkness over an hour before sunrise so that I could hike the mile to the deer stand. As I stood in the darkness to allow my eyes to adjust, I could hear a pack of feral dogs yipping and howling as if they were chasing a deer. I was making my way quickly down my trail and noticed that the dogs were getting closer. I thought to myself that if I felt they were closing in on me that I would get up in an old rotten stand midway to where I hunted. If they were a deer, they would run past my position, and if not, they would scatter, trying to find my trail. The sounds of the pack intensified, and it sounded like they were at the road where I was dropped. I hurried to the midpoint and could tell they had picked up their pace. I scurried up the makeshift ladder and got into the stand with my heart pounding. Then the most chilling thing occurred. They fell silent. I stood in that stand with my heart pounding, straining to listen for their approach. Suddenly they were there bursting from brush around the trail. In total, I would say there were over a dozen dogs of various breeds that had gone feral. No collars on any of them. They stopped and fanned out, sniffing once my trail was broken. I slowly turned and shifted my stance to get into a firing position. Since these dogs were clearly hunting me, they were a hazard to anyone in the wood. I started to raise my rifle when a very large chow chow looked up and started growling. The pack all started barking as the chow snarled and kicked dirt around it. This made it clear who was going to go first. My first chow was true and killed the chow instantly. I immediately went to work to take out as many as I could. The pack immediately ran the opposite direction and headed to even heavier brush and young pine trees. They melted into the forest rapidly, and as I fired, many shots were blocked by small trees. I was only able to take a few more of the pack out, but I, I think I made my point as we did not encounter any further sign of them on the property. It was probably 15 minutes before I stopped shaking from the encounter. After I calmed down enough to climb down, I was still stunned with processing what had just happened. I continued on to my deer stand and was able to harvest the dough and met my family at the road at my pickup time. I was out boot packing above the tree line, had a few friends with me. This was when snowboarding was my career. We were riding down to the bottom, ended up going through the trees and came up on a closed pist near the bottom, saw a small kicker, jump, and hit it with far too much speed as I was excited. Landed and couldn't turn quickly enough and rode off a cliff. It was near vertical with large rocks protruding that were mostly covered in snow. I fell about 10 meter before I even touched the cliff. Then as I hit the cliff face, I was falling through very loose powder and bashing rocks, still upright with my snowboard. My board got snagged on a rock, and I leant back and came to a stop. There was easily another 30 below me before it started to run out. I wasn't hurt, but I was stuck. My board was wedged, and it was the only thing holding me down. 
I saw a friend who was at the back of the pack ride passed further down the trail as it snaked into view and the back out of view again. I yelled like crazy and he paused then, just rode off even though I was still yelling him. So I was on my own, no signal, no way of communicating, radio left in my bag at the top of a lift we often used. Took me about ten minutes to decide to chance it. I started waiting one leg to see if my board would slip. It didn't. I unstrapped one foot, twisted my strapped-in leg 180, and kicked around to find footing and leaned by hand on the underside of an exposed rock. I found it eventually and tried to free my snowboard. I gradually clammed out. As the top of the cliff was fairly rounded off, it got easier as there was more snow, so I could kick my snowboard in and kick a hole from my other foot. Had to have a word with myself after that as I'd kept myself and others safe for years riding back country and I nearly feel to a severe injury. Right next to a closed fist because I was complacent. I was turkey hunting once on some land my aunt's family owns. And when I was walking through the woods, I noticed an area about six by six that had maybe 50 little red flags stuck in the ground. When I came out of the woods, I asked my uncle about the little flags, and he said that a guy killed a girl in the 80s and left her body in that spot. Those were the little police evidence flags I was seeing. It was creepy more than anything. When I was eight or so, my dad and I went fishing while camping at a pretty well-known river but is infamous for being extremely dangerous. While fishing on the side of this river, sitting by a rocky cliffside, we suddenly hear rushing water. I look at my dad and instinctively start running up this cliffside and get behind a massive boulder and my dad follows me. Instantly a wave of water hits the boulder, separates and goes around the boulder. The water rushes down the cliffside, wipes out all our fishing gear, and goes into the main river. My dad and I sit there behind the boulder for hours while being surrounded by this rushing water. Eventually, it gets to a point where we can hop from big rock to big rock while avoiding getting swept by the still rushing water. We go to the park ranger's office, and my dad gives them an earful. Apparently, they opened the dam, and we happened to be at the base of that opening. No sign, sirens, or other indicators. Or them releasing the dam or building a restricted area. Around 1994, I was living near Nashville, Tennessee, in a small neighborhood called Antioch. This is in Davidson County. I was out walking my dog one day, letting the dog do its business out in the front yard, when I could sense something was watching me. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and everyone around there was at work except me. I could just feel something watching me. I started looking at the woods directly in front of me. I couldn't see anything, but I did hear leaves rustling in the trees. So I started looking up towards the tops of the trees. The only way I could describe it and I don't even know if the movie had come out yet, was the cloaked alien in the Predator film. In the movie, they saw that invisible creature where you could see the outline of everything, but you can see right through it. It was sitting up in the very tops of the trees where it wouldn't hold the weight of a man by any means. This thing was as big as a man. I just stood there looking at it when I saw a quick flash of its eyes. It was a sudden bright yellow glow. I let go of the leash, and I took off on a dead run towards this thing. It literally started running across the tops of the trees. I know what I saw. While running, I thought about what I was doing. I then thought, what in the world are you doing chasing this thing? I stopped, and it stopped about a length of a football field away from where it started. It turned around and looked at me again with the flashing yellow eyes, and then it took off out through the woods, through the tops of the trees, out into the deeper woods. I didn't see it again. It scared the hell out of me. I never, ever told anybody about it, because I thought people would think I was crazy.
This occurred in September 2022 in the Wood Creek Reserve neighborhood in Katy. It was approximately 11.30 p.m., so I saw this girl standing by the side of the road. She looked like she may have been a preteen. I pulled over because I thought I could help her. She was just standing there, and I thought it was weird that a kid would be standing by the side of the road that time of night, so I pulled over to see if I could help. The first thing I did is I called it in. When I looked up, she had moved, and she was in front of the patrol car standing in the headlights. She was looking at me. She didn't seem afraid or worried, and I thought that was weird, so I told dispatch. I went to get out of the car, and just as I was starting to open my door, I saw her eyes. At that point, I didn't want to get out of the car. I realized that her eyes were totally black. I mean, completely black. She must have seen that I realized that because she started to approach the car. It took everything I could do not to drive away at that point. I mean, I'm a peace officer of the law. It's my job, but it was this visceral thing that just took over. I can't describe it, but all of my training had just gone out the window. Everything in me just wanted to get the hell away from that girl, but I stayed. I rolled down the window. As she approached me, I asked her where she lived, and she mumbled something. I leaned forward, and then she suddenly attacked me. This ungodly voice was then coming out of her. I had no idea how a human could make that voice, but I was trying to push her off of me. She was trying to pull me out of the car. I was screaming at her to get off. Me get off me, and then she said something. I can't get those words out of my mind, she said. We're going to die tonight. Why would she say that to me? I struggled to break her grip. Then I heard a loud crack. Then she went limp, and she fell onto the road. I thought that I may have seriously hurt her. I quickly got out of the car to see if she was okay. Then suddenly she stood up like nothing had happened, and she ran away into the dark night. But I could hear her laughing. She was not human. I'm telling you. When I got back to the station, I told my supervisor what had happened. He told me to ignore it and to not write up an incident report. I still patrol the same area. I believe that she is still out there roaming in the night. She was just not human. These incidents took place during my childhood years up until the day I graduated from high school in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We lived in an old three-story brownstone apartment building with a basement apartment. The whole building was owned by the family. Initially, my grandmother's sister lived in the basement with her family and her two brothers occupied the second floor. My family was on the first main floor and my grandmother was on the third floor. She believed in the superstition that if you moved down a level, if you lived in an apartment, you would soon die. She continued to climb the three flights of stairs even though she was very arthritic. As the years passed by, her sister and her immediate family eventually moved out and the two brothers on the middle floor passed away. The basement level was now empty and my mother, father, sister, brother, and I continued to live on the first floor. The second floor was empty, and my grandmother still resided alone on the third floor. There was never a thought of renting the vacant room. On several nights while we were asleep, out of nowhere the front door would slam waking everyone up. After a few seconds there would be footsteps moving up the metal stairs, followed by footsteps shuffling and creaking above us on the second floor. My father would jump up and rush to see who broke into the house. No one was ever there, of course, and things would be quiet again for a few weeks, and then it would happen all over again. The apartment was usually cold and drafty, so we would all stand next to a wood stove in the pantry because it was our heat source. On several occasions, we would see a faint apparition of someone walking towards the stove. Once in a while, we would think someone had come home and would say hello, only to be greeted by nothing. When I turned 10 years old, my mother was sleeping on the third level to help care for my grandmother. My mother recalled one incident when she woke and saw me standing beside her bed. She asked what I wanted. I turned, walked away, and disappeared. There was another incident where she rushed out of the bathroom on the first floor and was frantic because she heard her mom scream for her. 
My sister and I were shocked because we didn't hear anything. On another occasion, my grandmother's aunt had been sick and was in the hospital. We were driving home and my mother was resting her head against the window when suddenly she rose up and shouted, Oh my God, Aunt Jane just died. I just saw her face. My father looked at the clock and it was about 7 p.m. When we got home, the charge nurse was calling to let us know that she had passed away at the exact time. The most memorable incident happened when my brother and I were talking about the weird stuff that occurred in the house over the years. I said, yeah, like the old guy who used to watch us sleep. I was sort of half joking since I wasn't sure if he had ever known since it was never brought up between us. He turns and answers, you mean the guy that stood behind the dresser in the living room who leaned over with his hands behind his back. As he was talking, he duplicated the way the apparition moved exactly. That really freaked me out. This has happened in a village in Bangladesh. Basically, a 13-year-old girl apparently met a figure while going to the toilet at school. She then started to talk to herself. Got sick and body bloated up within three months, then died. Clarence could not afford to have her tested in hospital. Now parents and two remaining siblings are acting strangely. Both siblings are also sick, saying they all will also go, telling all visitors to get lost. Basically, the family lives next door to our family home. Money has been offered for hospital treatment. Thought I would share. This is second-hand information which my mother got. I personally think a supernatural entity caused this in first place. We'll provide update if possible. Thought I would share my first post. We was outside. I lived backed up to a forest. Dark enough to need slights in the forest or field or at the end of the steed where there's no light. My daughter made a loud shrill noise. Something made a weird noise back. The kids wouldn't be quite so I could hear it, but I swear it sounded behind my house. Kids minutes later decided to go play tag in field or edge of forest while we sat at edge of yard. Can still hear them, but not see. Not even five minutes later they come running, crying, saying they saw taller than the trail sign, seven feet, eight feet, all white, including its head skinny but its legs weren't as long as its torso. No hair on two legs. Glowing eyes never left the edge of the forest. They said they saw the eyes first, and by the time I got the flashlight and got back over there, they swore it walked into forest other side. My daughter swears it was just watching them when they locked eyes. Northwest Kentucky. This goes hand in hand with my sis stating she saw similar. 3 a.m. April 2023. Let dogs out. Heard crunching of forest material and dog went off turned on cell phone, flashlight, and seen a white, tall, gally looking creature in the tree. Black eyes tall. Can you tell me if this is it? What are we seeing? It never wants to interact, just watching runs if we typically shine lights. What does it sound like if it's a crawler? Please help. I was walking with a dog in the woods of Connecticut, and we were standing basically still as she was sniffing around. About 50 feet from the trail, I hear a lot of ruckus, like a lot. My first thought, what a mountain biker, but I don't believe their trails run along where I was. Then high schoolers hanging out or something, but this was during school hours. I kept lucky, and in that direction like an animal on alert. I saw something white. I saw no other color. Nothing of definition, but it was solid. I'd say a little bigger than me. I'm five foot six, 100 pounds. And he moved quickly from behind one tree to another closer by me. I was in army green, so my thought was, it was a lot easier for me to see it than it to see me. But that kind of movement is deliberate in my mind. Then I heard the noise, maybe 75 feet to the right. After that, the noise stopped completely and I was thoroughly scared like stop. 
I was mostly scared because it seemed so unnatural, and if it was human or animal, I'd think my German shepherds would notice it way before we heard it. I've heard of people doing witchcraft in the woods the next town over. I've always seen a lot of cairns there, and today a gnome statue sitting on this big tree root overlooking the water. I'm sure it was nothing but my brain definitely picked up on it. What could it have been? So about three weeks ago, I went out with my cousin and my dad and dog to set up a trail cam outside the cave entrance on our property. We drove 30 minutes to the property from the city and picked up my cousin along the way. We made it to the property and drove through the field on the property towards the tree line where there is an old fence that leads to a mostly dried up creek. We use as a path through the woods. There were no cows in the field. They aren't usually this time of year. I haven't been to these woods in a while, so I was surprised to see a family of deer my the tree line in the field. As I said in my other posts, the woods don't usually have very much wildlife, but I guess that has changed. Once we made it to the old gate by the tree line, we got out of the car and started walking down the dried creek. We eventually got to a small waterfall pond we use as a major landmark, I should note that we found no bones this trip. This is the first time I have ever not found bones. I have no idea where they could have went. We checked all the spots. We usually find them, but nothing. We started to walk up the side of the hill face towards where we believed the cave was. We kind of got a bit lost trying to find the cave until our dog ran through a small tree line. And when we followed her, we found her sitting in front of the cave's entrance. Me and my cousin put on our headlamps and got our flashlights and entered the cave. We took the dog with us, but our my dad stayed at the entrance of the cave. At the mouth of the cave was lots of scat of varying sizes. Mold was growing on a lot of the scat, and it was kind of hard to breathe. We will definitely bring masks next time. We made our way through the cave, finding more moldy scat. The air was completely still. When I shines my flashlight ahead of me, I could see the particles floating in the air were completely stationary. It was pretty cool to look at. We found a lot of cave crickets and one bat that we tried not to disturb. Deeper in the cave, we knew was a chamber that we were going to stop at. We continued through the cave till we found something weird, which is the main reason I'm making this post. Skin. On the floor of the cave was a tattered, warped piece of raw hide or some sort of leather. If I laid it out flat, it would have been 1.5 by 1 foot surface area. I have no clue what it was from or how it got in the cave. I'm assuming a coyote had carried it in and was chewing on it because it looked pretty beat up, but really rubbed me the wrong way. My cousin took a picture and we kept going. We made it to the chamber, and it was filled with large scat. It wasn't too big to have possibly been a really backed-up coyote, but it was definitely big. The cave went deeper, but to go deeper, we would have had to crouch down and get wet, and we didn't feel like doing that. Deeper in the cave, we could see some pieces of torn clothing. My dog tried to go deeper in the cave. But we didn't know what was back there, and we didn't want her to go without us, so we called her back and exited the cave. Me and my cousin set up the trail can on a tree at the mouth of the cave, and we began to head back to the car. I will have to go back soon to retrieve the trail cam and its contents. I have moved the past, the idea that there is a crawler in the woods. Or at least, if there ever was one, it's not active at the moment. Mostly because we didn't find any bones a trip, and it seems wildlife has returned to the woods. My brother did just recently tell me a story that my dad backed up. He says that he once found a dead cow with its eyes missing in the woods once. I'm going to go back for the calm, but I really want input on the skin. How did it get there? What was it from? Do animals keep skin? Is it possible for something to decompose and leave just its skin behind?
So, I was driving down a two-lane freeway with my partner around 11 p.m. There was a field to my right that I was very dark and further down the road. The field connected with a river. There was a bridge to cross the river and down in the roadside ditch. There were two sets of round, reflective yellow eyes, but in pitch black. I thought I was looking at deer until it clicked with the forward-facing eyes and the reflective yellow. I think I seen crawlers. Also, this takes place in southeast Ohio. I live in Florida, and although I've traveled a bit, I always felt this is home. My family is originally from New York, but we've lived here for quite several years. I was young and was living with somebody in a trailer out in a horse pasture. There was a campground, Mayaka State Park near Sarasota, just on the other side of the pasture, and we had made friends with the people who ran it. It was late summer and a bunch of the campers got together because they would be leaving soon to go back home, so a bonfire was being held that evening. There was a trail that led into the campground from where the trailer was, and everyone had gathered at our trailer for a farewell BBQ, then moved down to the campground after for the bonfire. After I had cleaned up the BBQ mess, it was getting dark, so I was pretty much the last one to arrive. The fire was started, and we all stood around talking. It was about 9.30 p.m. I was standing beside my friend on the outside edge of the fire when I happened to look across at the tree line. There is a fence there with low-lying palm scrub. It divides the other half of the pasture from the campground and back trails. As I looked in that direction, I saw two big red eyes staring back at me. The outline of this thing was pretty big by the glow of the firelight. The palm scrub is about four feet tall, higher in some spots. Not taking my eyes off this thing, I quietly whispered to my friend to look in that direction and don't scream. She did, and she whispered to her husband. He said softly to the group not to make any sudden moves. We were talking softly and alerting everyone in the group about the red eyes, and everyone looked and saw what we were seeing. There were eight of us all totaled. My girlfriend's husband returned with a flashlight and rifle in hand. He handed the flashlight to my friend and told her to shine it at whatever was in the scrub. When she did, this thing stood up and made a growling sound. My friend's husband then shot at it, and it screamed like nothing I had ever heard before. It took off into the brush, and everybody, except me, in the group ran to get flashlights and whatever to arm themselves with. My friend and I were told to stay by the fire. About that time, we heard the horses screaming in the pasture, and they hurried to the field. After a while, they all returned. They could not find anything and would resume the search at daylight. The next day, blood was found at the fence area, and a horse was dead. Its neck was broken, and its body was badly ripped apart. Searches were continued for a couple of days, and no one spoke about what happened. After several things happened where I was staying, we left. This was not the only time I have encountered a large red-eyed being. I believe this was in fact a skunk ape or Bigfoot that after being shot at purposely killed that horse. I have on another occasion encountered one again at night which chased me through the woods while walking home from my friend's house. I had not known at the time that a body was found in that area and that the arms of that poor soul were torn from their body. I was lucky. So I made a post a while back about something I saw in Michigan when I was in 5th, 6th grade. I moved to SKA a few years after that. I haven't seen anything since. I've been back several times, never saw anything like it again. So I'm driving home a couple buddies today, and all three of us see this white thing on all fours book it across the road. We all don't know what it was. It was fast. It looked like its legs were maybe bent 90 degrees at the knee to the side. It was all white, no idea if it was fur or skin. It was so fast we could only catch a glimpse of the legs. I damn near hit the thing with my car. We were all a bit spooked, but we were trying to think nothing of it. My one buddy is pretty spooked, so he invited a friend to come stay over. 
That friend who was going to stay over saw the thing, too, while he was pulling into my friend's neighborhood. I should point out I lived less than a mile from this friend, and the two sightings were less than a mile from my house. I live in a pretty big area, but you can get some woods here and there. I'm installing a dash cam tomorrow. I've had it forever. I don't know why I haven't installed it. We aren't sure what to make of it. But we are all spooked, so be spooked with us. The Neighbors I'm not sure if this is where I should tell this story, but I guess I'll start somewhere. Me and my wife moved into our home a little under two years ago. The first year, we had some interesting interactions with the locals of our new town. They told us stories of our home and the father and son, who had both passed away in the house. The father of old age and the son of a heart attack shortly after. I was on the fence of believing in the paranormal until we started noticing objects moving like our dog's balls and toys at first. Until it turned into larger objects like shoes and decorations. Odd objects that didn't belong in our yard showing up on our back stairs, things like doctor hinges and random pieces of ceramic. The house across from us was assumed abandoned even though we saw people every now and then going inside, until recently when a middle-aged man showed up to live there. Immediately after moving in, he got two young pit bull puppies. Both of them were white with brown spots in them. Me being a smoker, I go out nightly around 11, 12 for my final cigarette. I noticed some strange noises coming from the backyard and never really thought much of it. The other day, my wife asked me if the gray dog had always been over there. And now I noticed that the second white and brown dog had been replaced with a gray dog. Nothing I was very stressed about until tonight. While out on my smoke, I noticed a pack of deer in the field behind the neighbors. Normally our deer are terrified of humans, but this man just calmly walked through the pack as if they didn't even notice he was there. He bent down to try and pet his puppy who seemed to growl and back away from him. He looked over at me when this happened and slowly stood up and continued into the home. No lights turned on when he went inside. Being a little freaked out by this situation, I made my way inside slowly. I sat on the couch for a few moments so I could look out my living room window and keep an eye on this house. Still no movement or lights for about ten minutes. Then the blinds slowly slid open that face my house. I turned off the lights in my home and made my way to the bedroom where I'm typing this story. If anyone has any idea of what's going on, I'd appreciate some help and advice on where to go with this. I was thinking maybe a skinwalker or or a watcher of some sort. Maybe one of y'all have some information I could read into. I'd like to share these stories because it has always bothered me that I have not found an explanation for what I've experienced. About six years ago, I was living with my mom in a house built in 1914 in the city of Redondo Beach, California. It's a bit of an outdated house, but the yard is huge and the home is cozy. When we first moved and my sister heard a little boy whisper in her ear, Come play with me, we brushed it off and told her she must have been dreaming. However, my mom later experienced countless encounters with said little boy as well. Incidents were so far apart we kept brushing them off as half-asleep, daydreaming nightmares. Until one night I experienced something that didn't let me sleep for days. I got up to use the restroom around midnight. The bathroom door was cracked open and I could see through the bathroom mirror that my sister's boyfriend was standing behind the door. I awkwardly waited for him to get out since he was taking too long and I really had to go. I even began asking him if he was all right. I could see him clear as day, not moving. I then switched on the actual light. We had a night light in there, and there was no one in the restroom. I used the bathroom in shock because I convinced myself I was imagining things. Went back to bed and laid there frozen. A few weeks went by, and then again I got up around midnight to use the restroom. 
This time I saw my six foot one little brother standing behind the door with his gray sweater. He just got for Christmas and his fresh haircut. I knew he was trying to scare me. I mean, come on. It's my little brother. I start yelling at him to stop and get out now. He doesn't respond, so I say, that's not funny, and push the door all the way back. The door didn't hit anyone. This time I screamed and ran back to my room. I began to pray. I knew this time I 100% was not imagining anything. After I prayed and put a religious verse under my pillow, I never saw anything again. Not sure if it worked or it was a coincidence, but a year later I moved out. My mom still lives there. We recently celebrated my son's birthday at the house. It was dark and we were picking up the trash when we hear a little boy outside the gate saying, Mommy, open, Mommy. We run as fast as we can to open because we think we locked my two-year-old nephew out of the yard. When we get to the gate, no one was there. My nephew was inside safe and sound whole time. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.